We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. My name is Rob H. And this week I am here with... Joe Kluznick. Hello, hello. We are welcoming back Joe. This is your second time co-hosting with us. And uh, we promised we'd have you back at some point. And this is one that we actually kept pretty good for us it took a natural disaster to make it happen but yes yeah, thank you you know well that's that's what we count on around here and these days it's <laughs> like kind of kind of guaranteed uh yeah just want to say uh tom is away this week uh not surprisingly dealing with remediation contractors coming and going out of his house uh so uh yeah he sent me a quick text uh showing like the entire bottom third of all the drywall in his theater has all been chopped away and uh actually uh, a fun little tidbit. He'll he'll uh, regale us with this tale whenever he is back, perhaps next week. Uh, but you might have remembered how he said when he painted his room gray uh, that he didn't take down his projection screen. So back there yes. is still the original color. Well, in order to take down one third of his drywall, they had to uh, remove his projection screen. So it was like, well, I guess I'm painting behind my screen finally. So that's all it takes. <laughs> Flat black. Yeah. <laughs> this right. So before we dig in, just want to say a quick hello. How are you doing, Joe? Doing great. Recently returned from Cedia, trying to get back to work in uh, the real world, but uh, had a wonderful time there. Uh, everybody's uh, doing well in this house. Excellent to hear. Uh, yeah, we're going to have a little bit of uh, talk about Cedia, of course, but uh, yeah, well, just to tease it a little, uh, there's another podcast that we're all friends with, and Joe appeared there as well, so we'll mention that in detail coming up, but we're going to kind of split the uh, duties of all the Cedia coverage, because there's a lot to talk about, and there's no sense in duplicating it all and going for four hours, because we just don't have that kind of time. Uh, but yeah, just to let everybody know, this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions and Answered. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is email them to us. Our email address is question at avrant.com. That is far and away the best way to reach us, question at avrant.com. Uh, we have our website, of course, avrant.com, where you can come and see the show notes and our Flickr albums and links to the things that we're talking about. And uh, then, yeah, you can reach us other ways as well. We're on facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. You can see our videos on youtube.com slash avrant. And if we're mentioning images while we're uh, going through the questions and that will you'll be able to see those in real time as we talk about them so that's a handy way to watch things and uh, then yeah you can contact us all individually I am Rob at avrant.com Tom is Tom at avrant.com Lee who is our occasional guest co-host but I didn't even call him this week because I contacted Joe on short notice and he's like hey I wouldn't mind talking about home theater so that all worked out but uh, Lee is over at Lee at avrant.com and then uh, yeah if I'm on a social media of some some sort my handle will be at first reflect so wherever you might want to find me just type that in and i'll show up if i'm there and uh joe you're on uh, some social medias too how can people find you yeah you can find me on abs forum uh jsk mdwk or you can try me on what used to be twitter uh, at joe Kluznik. that's right if you happen to check it he might reply so uh there you go that's all the ways to reach us and uh yeah i'm gonna just go ahead and jump right in do a regular segment because uh, this all leads into what we're going to talk about so uh what we watched uh, we normally talk about here and you know what i'm gonna be a bad host and i'm gonna go first because that'll just lead us right Please on do. into our next section and uh so I'll, i can just very briefly tell you, I'm continuing on with Star Wars Rebels, like I said I would. I'm about halfway through season three right now, so continue to enjoy that show. Um, I've seen two episodes of Ahsoka now, so I'm kind of doing things all out of order and jumbled, but uh, it all does work quite nicely together, so uh, certainly... I can say worth a watch if you have the time. Uh, there are some filler episodes in the 22 episode seasons of uh, Rebels, but uh, overall, very much enjoying that show. And then uh, watched one movie this week, which was Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar. Uh, not sure. How did you pick that one? <laughs> you know what? And I've seen it too, so. Yeah, I, uh, I, 
I just bought Barbie, uh, and uh, but this was days before Barbie became available, and I was like, I just looked up movies that are somewhat similar to Barbie because I was in the mood to see something like that. This was one of the ones suggested. I don't know if I would... I mean, I can certainly see there are some similarities. Some of the same letters in the title? There are that. Barb is right there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is uh, Kristen Wiig, and uh, what is the other co-star's name there? I had to look her up. Uh, Annie Mumolo. Uh, Mumolo? I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. Very apologize for that, but you know, I wasn't super familiar with her, and uh, looking up some of her IMDb credits, she's actually done more writing than acting. Uh, like she wrote on uh, Bridesmaids um, and um, yeah, played some roles uh, like like guest spots on a lot of TV shows and that. But yeah, um, I was really impressed with uh, certainly the pairing of Kristen Wiig and Annie on screen. Uh, a lot of the humor in Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar uh, is like the two of them just rapidly talking over each other, saying uh, it's almost a little bit like the, the old SNL sketch that uh, Kristen Wiig used to do with Fred Armisen. Um, where like he would start saying something and then Kristen Wiig would like copy him and there's a bit of that same dynamic going on between these two characters and it really works well um that part's very funny I can say the humor overall is somewhat similar to like Austin Powers I felt a, a, a little, little more subtle than Austin a Powers a little bit yeah. yeah but I felt there was some similarity there if you're kind of trying to get a vague sense of what type of humor is going on here but I did feel overall the movie was kind of uneven there was quite a bit of tonal whiplash um it felt like there was almost like three types of movies jumbled together in here and 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 several things that seemed like scenes that were written separately from the movie and then just kind of inserted because they felt it was a funny scene so i wouldn't say it was like the most polished of scripts and execution but i did laugh several times throughout this movie it is a very very silly movie uh a little bit crude in places but not overly so uh so yeah uh, i kind of enjoyed that one i mean it's it's not like going to be one of my favorites or anything but yeah it was kind of funny yeah, as as I recall, we watched that you know mid pandemic when we were desperate for new content, and it was just you know, just dropped, and so it was like okay, we yeah, can I think watch it was twenty twenty one that one came out, yeah. so yeah, that flew under the radar. So I don't mind saying, hey, yeah, if you're in the mind in the mood for a chuckle and you wouldn't mind something silly, that uh, yeah, Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar might just suit what you're looking for. Uh, but Joe, what have you been watching? In well, I mean, it's been a couple of months since we've talked to you, but just recently. yes, so so very most recently, uh, like I said, we were at Cedia, and, and my wife and I went together. So it's her first time and my fifth or sixth but as we walked by the kaleidoscape booth they were showing a clip from the shallows mm -hmm. which was a movie i hadn't seen before okay. so uh Played right there on the show floor uh pressed a couple buttons on the phone i said okay we'll watch it when we get yeah. home so we watched that uh, on sunday and had fun with it uh as as dj and i talked about i uh, watched a bunch of the clips mm -hmm. that we saw on the showroom floor mm -hmm. uh at the cd expo once i got home so uh, lots of, you know, Maverick, Mission Impossible, yep. <laughs> um, a number of different Marvel films, Spider-Man, Doctor There's Strange, John Wick all, all in kinds there, of I stuff. Think, yeah. A little bit of that. But yeah, so uh, I went back and, you know, on the Glide Escape, mm -hmm. watched a bunch of those different uh, clips myself just to see how if my, you know, my system stood up to the big <laughs> dollar ones. But yeah. So yeah, The Shallows was, uh, the thing I thought was unique about that was there are a lot of inserts of other screens. So there are okay. times where... Uh, on the main screen, you're watching what's happening, but you're also seeing what she's looking at on her phone. Okay, yeah. Or you're seeing her watch right. dial as she's timing the shark. Spoilers, there's a shark in it. Yes. Um, <laughs> or, or So there's just a lot of uh, unique ways that they were bringing uh, a second screen okay. element into it. So I thought that was uh, something I hadn't seen in a lot of other mm -hmm. movies. But yeah, good movie. Um, visuals were really good. Um, you know, good underwater sound so and it I is like quite it. a isolated movie there's very much a, a woman against the elements movie yeah there's on like her own. six people in the cast right. and all of it's her really but yeah all right but yeah so i had fun with that one and then uh caught a little bit of the uh, nfl denver broncos game yesterday watching them lose to the raiders uh the thing i, I laughed i think the most about it was during the fourth quarter started pouring and we had just okay. been in uh denver the day before and we had beautiful <laughs> weather during the entire expo oh well, there you go. It, it must just follow you around. You're a good luck to right, right. Well, I mean, you've been watching that stuff, but we neglected the first time that you were on. And I can't believe that we did, but it was because we had so much to get through. And we got a packed show again today, but we promised we would do this. You were watching those shows. What were you watching them on? Because we didn't get a rundown of what is in Joe's home theater the last time you were on. And so we must this time with all priority. Well, and it's good uh, that we're talking now because I recently uh, made an upgrade. But uh, yeah, so 
running through the system, starting with video. I'm using a Stewart film screen, Studio Tech 130. It's a 235 to 1 micro perf screen. It's the uh, JKP signature. So it's 120 inches wide, 130 inch diagonal. All right. So, I mean, that screen. is Studio Tech 130. So a little bit of gain on there, right? It's the 1.3 benchmark. But you gain. lose a little bit with the micro perf. So, yeah. And you know what? Just before we go any further, I, I would just want to get your take on a movie like Oppenheimer coming up, where they're going to have the changing aspect ratios if you get the disc version anyway. We know that much. What is your your uh, approach in your own personal theater since you've gone with the 2.35 to 1 screen. Sure, and, and I picked that because I like watching my movies larger than I like watching mm -hmm. my television, right? Um, there are times, so uh, on my Harmony remote uh, with my JVC projector, mm -hmm. I have four presets. So I have a 60 by 9, a 235, a 2.0 to 1, and then a 235 crop. Okay. And so if I know it's a changing aspect ratio, I, I think I set that up after Maverick. Uh, Top Gun Maverick came out because I didn't want to be switching back and forth, and I just figured what they're showing above and below the screen, I don't yeah, need the, to see that Yeah, the zooming much. isn't fast enough to go with the scene <clears throat> changes where it's going back and forth in something like Oppenheimer. Not, not at all. It's my my NX5 took about 30 seconds to change. Yeah. I, my new projector takes about 45 seconds to change, oh, okay. so I'll jump into that. Uh, recently acquired a used but in excellent condition JVC NX9. Okay. Uh, 4K native projector. And we should Rob told me yeah, that's the not to buy this on the show. <laughs> What's, oh, uh, <laughs> that is but, the NX, <laughs> so that's the lamp based NX version nine. that's still, but it has the uh, frame by frame dynamic tone mapping that JVC continues to support and update with their firmware updates, so that's nice. Yeah, they're, they're updating the NZ, nine, NZ stuff now, the NX stuff, they're not, oh, okay. uh, they, who knows if they that. will or not, but uh, I have the most recent version of the firmware that we loaded onto it. But have been very impressed by the projector. Mm. Um, going from the five to the nine, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, at retail it was a three hundred percent, you know, price yes, delta, right, yeah. and I, I'm guessing I'm seeing a fifteen percent uh, <laughs> image improvement. So uh, I am noticing, yeah, better highlights on it. Okay. It is sharper, yeah. definitely. You know, when you well, go to a hundred millimeter lens, lens, is really nice on the nines. It's a oh, very high quality lens. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, been very happy with that. Mm -hmm. That was a, a recent acquisition. Uh, picked it up used, like I said. Uh, for speakers, uh, behind the MicroPerf screen, I'm using three of the Sonance Cinema yeah. LCR1 for the front stage. Uh, that is an enclosed in-wall speaker. Mm -hmm. Uses two five and a quarters, a four inch, and a tweeter. Um, on the sides and rears, I'm using four of the Sonance Cinema Select THX in-walls. Mm -hmm. Uh, the overhead, I'm using four of the Sonance S623 in ceilings for my Atmos uh, immersive. And I also have for my wide channels two Sonance Cinema Select cabinets. Uh, and went with those because I'm able to put them in the right place and angle them in the right way. That is, yeah, uh, having those. If you just like flush mounted in walls as your wides and have them fire straight across the room at each other, that's going to be a bad. That's going to be severely off axis for all of the listeners. Uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, so uh, we've come to what a, a nine uh, floor level speakers and four overhead speakers is what you're running there. Correct, and then the the subwoofers. I'm using two of the SVS uh, SB16 Ultras. Um, in my particular room, they're both uh, on the front wall, one in each corner. I've tuned them with uh, the mic and Roo, uh, radio, uh, sorry, uh, Room EQ Wizard. Mm -hmm. uh, so have pretty good response with that, okay. uh, at least not, in my main listening scene. Not 24 subwoofers, Joe? I mean, how, no, how do you live? No. How do you that's, live? That's, that's my next dream system. <laughs> right. I'm going to win the lottery first. Um, for seating, I'm using 11 Cinematech Terminator 2 motorized chairs. They're in chocolate leather. Mm -hmm. I have a front row of six. Uh, I have a that's six individual seats. My back row of five is two love seats and one single. Uh, funny enough, I, I picked these up from uh, used from a Hollywood mogul who okay. didn't build a house yeah. that these were supposed to go into. Uh, and with that seating uh, arrangement, you can kind of do the thing where some people's heads kind of like are in between the other people's heads, so you don't necessarily have to have everyone fully yeah, height and above everyone. Ba else. Back row. Back row's on a 10-inch riser, okay, so yeah. it's, it's no problem in nice. my opinion. So seating for 11, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the seats is way too close to one sidewall, <laughs> but what are you going to do? That is the lesser uh, used seat. I'm sure that you don't have a lot of people all the time. <laughs> Rarely do they all get filled up, I think, once or twice a year. Uh, for pre-amplifier, I'm using a Marantz uh, AV8805. Mm -hmm. uh, it's doing all my processing, switching, etc. For amplifiers, I have two matching Marantz mm 8077. Those are the 7x150. Mm -hmm. So if you're counting, that is 14 channels of amplification yep. uh, at 150 watts. 
For my server, I'm using a Clydescape Astrato 10 terabyte along with a Terra 24 terabyte uh, for storage. Uh, I think I have room for 21 movies left on it. So at some <laughs> point, we're going to be looking at making an upgrade. Uh, oh, I see. Ra- rather than uh, just taking some off storage and re-downloading them if you need to, because you, uh, you know, you know they are it, in your account. Th- true enough. But I'm, I'm one of those people that if I see it on the screen, uh-huh. I want to be able to play it right away. Obviously, if I own it but it's not on the screen it could be in my account but yeah i'd rather I have instant gratification right <laughs> Fair enough. i want i want all the james bond movies i want all the star wars movies i want all the star trek i want all the marvel nice. i want all the x all the so yeah uh, i'd rather have the storage for those and be able to watch them immediately <laughs> i have collecting dust a uh, uhd player which is my oppo udp 203 mm-hmm. I absolutely love that player, but honestly, we're watching most of the stuff on Kaleidoscape. Yeah. Uh, anything you know, not I mean, worth buying, People are still paying a on. premium for those players if you sell them, so hey, you can put uh, those funds towards expanding your Kaleidoscape, maybe. Yeah, but then there are the times where I'm a Blu-ray or even a DVD, and I'm like, I need a... It's, you can get a Panasonic, you know. Yeah, it's it's too nice of a player. It's got a nice rack round on it. Mine. <laughs> yeah, DJ said he regrets getting rid of his. Yeah, He's I looking know. for another one. So I'm like, I'm not. My, it was a gift for my wife, so ah, I'm going to keep that go. one in the rack. Uh, <laughs> then uh, DVR, I'm using a TiVo Premiere. Um, then that's mostly for live sports, things like mm-hmm. that. Uh, for the remote, there's a Logitech Ultimate ah, in the hub. You're still rocking so, with the Logitech. <clears throat> yeah, I've got three of them in the house, uh-huh. and I've bought a bunch of those used off eBay. <laughs> They're pretty solid still. So I. I I don't know what I'm going to do if those ever go uh, away. I know, right? yeah. uh, I'm using an Apple TV 4K for the streaming duties. Uh, on the networking side, I have an HP Proker 1410 24G switch, okay. and it's almost full. I mean, okay. with <laughs> the amount of gear that's uh, connected to the internet in the rack, it's, it became critical. You're a hardwired fan, I must say. <laughs> 100%. Uh, for gaming, I have an original Xbox okay. and an Xbox One in the rack. Uh, I have a 360 somewhere in the house. It may go back in the rack at some point. Uh, so that tells us, you know, it's, it's not vital that you have the 4K 120 support just yet in your uh, yeah. P-Pro and your, and your projector. <laughs> yeah, and what's funny is most of the kids have moved on to PC gaming okay. and they're not so much on the Xbox anymore. Yeah. Uh, for power conditioning, I got a couple of oldies but goodies: a uh, Monster Power Signature HTPS 7000 Mark II and a Signature Monster Power ABS 2000 I Pro. I do remember those. Good to know that they're still still working, still going strong. They, it's that's got uh, several years. You must have had those at this yes. point. Yes, and they've got pretty blue lights, and they've never let me down. <laughs> so, uh, but living in California, you know, we do suffer from brownouts right. and things yeah. like that. But all of my equipment is plugged into it. It's been rock solid ever mm-hmm. since. Uh, everything's in the middle Atlantic uh, rack. It's an MRK 4026. For cooling, I'm using two of the middle Atlantic QBP rack mount fans. Mm-hmm. One above uh, well, the amplifier, one above a preamp, and those do a pretty good job of circulating air in the rack. All my cabling is primarily monoprice for my balanced interconnects, uh, monster cable speaker wire in wall, and then uh, a bunch of acoustic treatments, DIY stuff. I yeah. uh, pretty much did all of those myself. So front wall is about two inches of lint acoustic over the entire front wall. Mm-hmm. That's behind cloth uh, and behind the screen. And then um, Owens Corning, I think it was ARC was the brand, uh, fiberglass. Mm-hmm. But uh, a couple of uh, two by eight, uh, four inch deep base traps are kind of on the side front walls. And that really helps to frame it out all in black. And then uh, five or six other uh, two by four by two inch or four inch deep panels scattered around the room. Mm-hmm. So, so pretty good uh, amount of absorption. Um, Roughly, like I said, all the... what dimensions are your room here? I'm, I'm assuming this is a dedicated space, given what you're working. Sorry. With. So, yeah, if you if you want to take a look at the room, it is on AVS form, okay. and the threads title is "What would you do starting over with a 19 by 21 by nine? There room. we go. Right. So, so that's. That's the theater room. I keep looking out there because I'm in my office, which is serves as my equipment rack, okay. my arcade, my media storage, <laughs> my posters. Um, and then there's also, this is upstairs. We're in California. You don't have basements out here. So this is a bonus room that is above uh, the garage and okay. downstairs. Uh, we also have a bathroom and a kitchenette that are up here. So this was really 
this is a house that we bought that I knew we could put a mm-hmm, theater into. Mm-hmm. It was, it was a, an existing home that I think they kind of set this up more as maybe like an in-law quarters okay. or something like that. Uh, but it's got turned into the theater yeah. floor. Helps with so, the soundproofing end of things when it's already yeah, slightly el- isolated from it, the rest of the living quarters. Um, <laughs> you, you get nice tactile base. Yeah. You know, um, the first time I tried one of those SVS subs, I think I was playing some kind of techno music mm-hmm. and my son thought we were being invaded yeah. he was downstairs in his room <laughs> well yeah, and yeah, yeah just... like you said you have the sb16 ultras right so i mean mm-hmm. it's the sealed ones so i mean there there's even more output to be had even oh. within svs's lineup uh you know way down low if you'd gone with the port it's 21 by 19 by 9 that's not us that's not a small uh home theater um, no it's it's a good size yeah, room yeah. seating for 11 um we did put a Solid core door on it. Okay. Uh, we have painted the ceiling is entirely the tricorn black, so it's it's definitely a theater room when you come up nice. here. Uh, on the stairway leading up, I've got about twenty one different other movie posters mm-hmm. uh, that line the hallway. I've got a couple uh, as you go towards the bathroom, and then the, my autographed ones are here behind me in the office. Very nice. You know what? I just had a quick curiosity because I mean, you do uh, professional installations. That's part of uh, the job that you're that you're doing and that you have done. And I mean, I just noticed like you know, for streaming, you went ahead and got yourself an Apple TV 4K. And I'm just wondering, like, even in the higher end systems, like from from stuff that I've seen, it's still a popular device. You know, we're we're an Apple family. Everyone's got okay. iPhones. We've got uh, an Apple, and I've had multiple generations of the Apple TVs um, for years now. And they you know, hand them out to the kids when I buy new ones. Okay. But uh, we have the, the very latest version is downstairs in the family room. I've got a little bit older. You know, Obviously, the slightly more expensive one that had the Ethernet jack on it because the less expensive one doesn't have it, the Ethernet port anymore. It was. It was. And I, like you said, I'm a hardwired fan. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, um, it just made sense to go with the Apple. I think that their interface is really easy to use. I think it's uh, being able to use the phone or the remote control. And honestly, like, there's not yeah. the gigantic ad at the top of everything like so many other streamers have, like just and littered it's, with it's, ads. It's super reliable. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think I've ever really had to reboot that thing. Right. It's just rock solid for what we need. And again, you know, when we're streaming, I've got a bunch of my movies uh, in uh, Apple iTunes. Sure. I've got more of them on... Uh, movies anywhere but but easy to access all of that stuff and then you know if it's hulu or netflix or whatever else we're watching it's uh, well, there you go. it just goes to show i mean even if your budget is limited you can have one item that even the pros have and you can feel good about it <laughs> there you go <laughs> Well, why don't we crack on ahead here and uh, start by thanking our listeners of the week, uh, who are people who have supported this podcast in some way. Sometimes financially is the way that they support us. And uh, I do know that Andy uh, sent us a PayPal donation. So over at avrant.com, our website, uh, if you go to the right-hand side on the desktop version, you'll see an image of a cup of coffee and it'll say support AV Rant. If you click on that, it'll take you to our PayPal donation page where you can uh, donate any amount that you like for a single time. You don't have to have a PayPal account you could just use your credit card or you could sign up to make a recurring donation if you want to via paypal so andy thank you very much for that support if anyone else uh, made a paypal donation this week i don't know about it because tom is the only one who sees it andy let me know via email that he did that donation so uh we'll catch up with you whenever tom is back in case i missed any paypal donors uh other people who have supported us financially have done so through patreon.com slash av rant podcast you can go there to uh sign up to make an automatic monthly donation one dollar per month is the minimum sign up there and they keep a little cut of that for themselves and then give the rest to us so we have 133 patrons over there and thank you all very much for your patronage for your financial support we appreciate it very very much and then uh, sometimes you. people just send in notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going, which is, you know, very appropriate these days. Uh, we have been going through quite a few things here. So Elmer thanked us for going over the NAD specific process for setting up and calibrating with Dirac because it is a little bit slightly different from even the uh, things that Dirac has on like their own setup videos. There are some NAD specific things that they want you to set there and they do have a page for that. So we link to that for Elmer. Uh, Parker appreciates how we've kept the podcast going through natural disasters, the pandemic, absences, whatever else life throws our way. Uh, So appreciate that very much. Matt sent us in a note of gratitude. Jay just wanted to send good vibes Tom's way and his hopes that everything goes at least somewhat smoothly with his restoration. We absolutely feel the same way, Jay. Uh, Kev in the UK, uh, he sent such a nice heartfelt email to us and to DJ over at uh, Brightside Home Theater Podcast, where, by the way, Tom appeared uh, a week or two ago 
ago. Joe just appeared this very same week that this episode is coming out. So uh, both uh, Tom and Joe have been on Brightside Home Theater podcast recently. Um, Kev wanted to thank us for the knowledge, wisdom, fun, laughs, and everything else we've provided and says he will appreciate us forever. So thank you very much, Kev. Uh, Kevin, different person, is thinking of Tom and his family, hopes things get sorted out swiftly. Carl was very sorry to hear about Tom's situation and he enjoyed Tom's chat with DJ there just a couple weeks ago. Uh, Andy is a member of our Two Hour Plus Club and he is a longtime listener. Scott says he's been a faithful listener since the end of 2019. He came for the knowledge. He stayed for the snark. So uh, yeah, that's (laughs) that's very much appreciated. I'll have to let Tom know about that one. Grinder sent us a note of gratitude and Daz is also hoping all the best for Tom. So thank you all so much for sending those in. It is very much appreciated and a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send and your questions. I will thank them also. So thank you, Elmer, Parker, Matt, Jay, Kev, Kevin, Carl, Andy, Scott, Gerinder, and Daz. Thank you very much, Joe. That is very nice to have those names all in a row just like that. So we're going to uh, go ahead and get into the news. And yeah, we're going to be focusing on Cedia. Uh, I did not attend, but Joe did attend. So that was taking place over this past weekend as we're recording this. Uh, We're sure there will be more stories and coverage coming out online as people get a chance to write that up and post it. Uh, But yeah, since Joe was there in person and uh, DJ was there in person too our friend over from Brightside Home Theater Podcast, you two got together and had a chat. So uh, yeah, we're going to have the link to that in our show notes. You can also just go to brightsidehometheater.com and see the most recent episodes and you'll know that Joe Klusnick's name is there. So yeah, uh, I mean, just really briefly, some of the things you touched upon, uh, yeah, you can can just let us know. I Basically, you went around to a lot of the demonstration rooms is is quite a bit of what you talked about in that episode, yeah? Yeah, so short recap, I was really there for the education side, so all day Thursday, all day Friday. I was pretty much in back-to-back classes. I was able to sneak away to see uh, one demo at lunchtime on Thursday and then Friday after classes, got a little bit of time on the floor. It was really Saturday. I was able to spend the entire okay. day uh, seeing demos and we hit as many as we could between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. We were there from uh, the time they let us go up the escalator to the closing bell. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife and I saw as many demos as we could. She said they all sounded the same. I thought they <laughs> had a little bit of difference here and there. But, uh, yeah, so it was a lot of fun. Um, and, and this was probably my fifth, sixth, seventh maybe CD that I've been to. Okay. So I've been to Indianapolis and, and as well as um, shows in San Diego. Um, but this one being in Denver, Colorado. Mm-hmm. Really a very well attended, excellent venue, location, uh, hotels, restaurants, weather. I mean, it was just really a uh, perfect location. For Excellent. It. Yeah. And I mean, this to me, like, ju- I mean, I didn't attend in person, but just the vibe I got from a lot of the coverage online is this, this really felt like it was back in full force after the pandemic, which obviously put a damper on attendance while all yeah, those restrictions I- were in place. I had gone to the 2021 at the end of pandemic and it was a ghost town. I think there were, you know, a few hundred people and there were a few thousand at this one. So yeah, Yeah. massive improvement. So, I mean, for myself, just uh, looking at things online, the coverage that has come out so far as we're recording this, which is on a, on a Tuesday here, like I didn't notice this being a year of particularly like revolutionary product announcements, uh, just as far as coverage online goes. uh, First glance, it seems more like, uh, like a refinement type of year, like projector and AV receivers didn't have any like big announcements for um, you know more towards the consumer space we had some barco projectors up in the you know two hundred thousand dollar range and stuff like that but you know that you're gonna see those things at cedia of course but it wasn't a year where like you had a whole new jvc lineup or a whole new sony lineup or something like that av receivers largely sort of stood pat but there were a few items that i thought were worth mentioning so uh we can go ahead and dig into those um we already talked about like the officially supported dolby vision projectors from uh a wall vision and and from uh, Jimmy, X Jimmy, we don't know how to pronounce this thing. Even Joe didn't know how to pronounce it. You've, you've been to the show. Uh, but we can add high sense to that list of officially uh, supporting Dolby Vision projectors. Uh, their $5,500 L9H Laser TV, as they market it. It's an ultra short throw projector, a triple laser light engine. And it comes bundled with either a 100 inch or a 120 inch ambient light rejecting screen uh, for it to go along with uh, ultra short throw. So that has the official Dolby Vision support there. That's something that uh, was profiled. Um, also, keeping with Hisense, uh, they have released now their 100-inch U8K mini LED TV model, which, uh, despite the model name, is still a 4K resolution. <laughs> they actually talked about how in 2024, the model number is going to end with an N because there was like, they didn't want 
L for I can't remember exactly what reason. They didn't want M because they thought that would think make people think of mini LED if and if it didn't have mini LED. So they went to N. I'm like, you didn't think K was going to be confusing for yeah, 8K? No, <laughs> not at all. I mean, even guys. 6K, 7K, whatever. But that was just the K is just denoting the 2023 model year. But regardless, yeah. the U8K series has already been out. But now they've got a 100 inch model that goes in there. Honestly, the specs are like virtually identical to TCL's QM8 model. And the U8K is also uh, officially priced at $10,000, just like TCL's QM8 is. Uh, but, you know, this one, it's two inches bigger because the QM8 is 98 inches. This one's 100. So it's got to be that much better for about the same price. Uh, but you know what? Why stop at 100 inches? Uh, because TCL uh, made note. This was actually over at IFA, but with, that's taking place largely at the same time as Cedia, just the, just the week prior there. Uh, they TCL mentioned their uh, X11G Max TV with over 20,000 mini LEDs in its backlight and a claimed 5,000 nit peak light output. Uh, but the whole thing here with the uh, X11G Max is that it goes all the way up to 115 inches. They're making use of those 11 generation uh, LCD fabrication plants and going beyond 98 up to 115. It's only available in China right now. Uh, they have plans to bring it over to Europe next year. North America is uncertain. They, they say now, they might... Now, can you just... Can you just put on a picture of the sun and use it like a tanning bed? I mean, we're getting there. You know, I mean, honestly, the sun is billion nits. <laughs> it's way, way up there. So, you know, a meager 5,000. But yeah, that's, that's some pretty bright highlights. Uh, so, I mean, I mentioned how Barco has uh, had uh, some gigantic projectors, in particular their uh, Nerthus projector that we actually talked about last week. Got a price point on that of $225,000 plus more for the lens because you have to have and, a and I, lens. Well, uh, so I got a picture next to this. Uh, did talk with the reps there. The, the lens is included, but it's not in the box. I see. Okay, that's included in the price, though. Wasn't there like a, a a very short throw or ultra short throw for the rear projection version of it too? I think you, there was you, some mention of that. And I was talking. So Chris Deutsch was the guy with Barco, uh, who I've known for a while on the JVC side. But uh, I mean, he said you can you know get from a few feet to yeah. like you know 100 feet if, depending on the room size and there's a lot of different lenses I just that they can I kind of loved with. the idea of using it like a in the room in front of the screen ultra short throw projector having yeah. <laughs> this thing this thing was the size of the freezer that's in my garage right. it's it takes six people to lift this thing. It's I mean, a massive. large amount of that is the cooling, I would think, because it's all I, built into one single unit. It doesn't have separate cooling for the laser light engine. So, uh, But, you know, if, if $225,000, a, a projector that size with its, what was it, 32,000 lumens or somewhere mm -hmm. in that vicinity, might have been 36, but up in that range. If, if that's right up your alley, then I had to mention that uh, perhaps Macintosh's $50,000, 458-pound, six-and-a-half-foot-tall PS2, 2K quadruple 13 inch subwoofer tower. It might be just what you're looking for. In fact, multiples of them. It does have the ability to daisy chain. Very important because you wouldn't want to stop at just one of these. Uh, the cabinet is carbon fiber. Each of the four drivers gets its own dedicated class D amplifier. Although, each of those four amplifiers only rated at 500 watts. I was a little bit surprised at that. I was like, really? We're going to do $50,000 for a 13-inch uh, driver's individual amplifiers. We're going to top out at 500 watts RMS uh, for each of those drivers. But, you know, 2,000 watts combined. Um, of course, what you're really paying for with the Macintosh product is that lovely trademark blue VU meter that's built into the Pretty base. blue lights. It makes it clearly all worthwhile, $50,000. Now, you're, you're going to need 200 grand to put one in each corner. Though. That's right. And where else would they go? But uh, yeah, those were some of the fun things that I did see mentioned online. Like I say, Joe and DJ have a ton of CDA coverage that they went through. And rather than duplicating it all, because uh, they spent an hour and 45 minutes talking about CDA. And I'm like, you know what? That is fantastic. I am very happy they did that. We can go through these fun stories that they didn't necessarily spend a ton of time on. But uh, yeah, uh, one of the things that you did talk about, but I do want to mention again here, because uh, it seemed like the most talked about demo online. Line, I saw the most coverage of this was Trinov's waveform demo. Yeah. Um, so they custom built an enclosed, perfectly rectangular demo room on site uh, there. Although, like you were mentioning, DJ, not exactly fully soundproof. <laughs> you, could, no, you could still hear no. sound coming in from the show floor. Uh, but they partnered up with Ascendo speakers and they delivered a 13.24.6 configuration. And yes, that's 24 subwoofers, 12 of them built into the front wall, the other 12 built into the back wall. 
and that's Trinov's version of a double bass array. So uh, they also partnered with Barco, Seymour Screen Excellence, Mad VR, and Kaleidoscape to present a 190-inch width CinemaScope screen uh, with three rows of tiered seating that uh, would be able to hold, uh, what was it, 18 viewers all at the same time? And right. uh, it, it seems as though at many times they actually had a few more people standing room only in that room while that was going on. Uh, but yeah, a very interesting demo space. So they had a handful of different clips that they were showing from uh, different movies to demonstrate different configurations of the double base array. Sometimes they were using as few as five out of the 24 uh, drivers, and those were 21 inch drivers, all of 24 of them. And uh, sometimes they had like just the front array going with only a couple of subs at the back. And then uh, they had, of course, the demonstration with all 24 four of those drivers going so since you were able to take that demo in for yourself uh we can hear directly from you how how, how yeah. did it sound <laughs> impressive yeah i mean so um first of all i think that was the same room they used uh at last year's cd also so okay. i don't think the structure changed but uh, the equipment inside did change and and really that was one of the reasons i was going this year is i yeah. wanted to hear that for myself i wanted to know what the you know the waveforming technology Sounded like I actually took one of the classes from uh, the Trunov co-founder um, earlier, and he, he talked about the technology behind it. Very impressive technology, what they're doing with it. It's it's beyond just the double base array. Mm -hmm. Just from a really quick description of how it works, you produce your base uh, at the front of the room. The entire wall of subwoofers creates a planar wave mm -hmm. that moves through the room, not impacted by the sidewall, ceiling, or floor reflections. You experience that wave, and then the back wall is played delayed and out of phase mm -hmm. and cancels all the mm -hmm. bass, right? So it just goes away. Yeah. The, the closest thing I was thinking about this that I can relate this to, I do a lot of shooting. So I'm uh, uh, on my son's on a trap team, and we shoot a lot of trap together. Mm -hmm. It's like standing next to someone firing a shotgun okay. outside, okay. right? The, it, it hits you, it's yeah. quick, it's fast, and then it's gone. You know, I, I saw a couple of people mention, though, because, I mean, uh, some of the demo clips they use, pretty familiar demo clips that people mm -hmm. have seen, and I saw a handful of people mention, they're like, yeah, it was like the cleanest, most distortion-free, most transient impact, uh, instantaneous, cleanest response they've heard. And yet, there was a part of their brain that was like, I'm used to the rumble, and there's no rumble. <laughs> but I would say it's it's closer to a real-world experience. Okay. Uh, th those 21-inch drivers go way down deep. I did take an infrasonic bass class right. also, uh, where they were talking about that. So, yeah, it was it was an impressive demo. Mm -hmm. uh, image looked good. It was huge. Um, overhead effects, uh, I think I did mention this with DJ. We listened to part of uh, Spider-Man, where... Mysterio is yeah. creating illusions and the overhead effect mm. was moved so smoothly mm -hmm. across the ceiling, right? So I've got a, a four speaker Atmos setup and this was using, I believe, six. Yeah. But it just panned really, really well. I and was I, kind of surprised sure, they didn't go for the full 10, but you know. <laughs> I, I'm sure some of that was the turn off processing. Yeah, they, yeah. they had a huge amount of power in that room. They had was it 1.4 metric tons of subwoofers in there? It yeah, was right. it was crazy. The, uh, one of my only thoughts though, though was because of course they didn't have this as an AB comparison, which was you do you did have the bespoke constructed on site rectangular dedicated enclosed room, and I'm like if you had just done a traditional four subwoofer setup, how much of a difference would there have been? So, because <laughs> so what's funny is I, I I watched this one and then uh, a day or two later got over to the Gramani system. Yeah. Uh, and that did use four subwoofers, okay. one in each corner, okay. and two 21-inch subs for infrasonic. Okay. And those, the two 21s were both uh, on the floor up front behind the screen. Okay. But so it, it really, I, I think, and I talked with some of the other designers that were there about this, it feels like a paradigm shift in that up until now, everyone's really been following, you know, the Todd Welty and the Harmon yes. research yeah. in, in using, you know, four subs all in phase, maybe, you know, delayed. But this is a entirely revolutionary different approach okay. but it's also insanely expensive to implement i mean at obviously this 24 of them is going to be more than four <laughs> yeah so but but they did say you know depending on the size room you have they have configurations where you can go two by two right. um the demos using fewer subs or mix and match number of subs they really kind of saved that for the vip stuff during the show floor time, it was all 24 that you were listening to. Okay. Uh, I think in my room, if I were going to do this myself, I would probably use a six and six okay. uh, array, uh, which, yeah, it's a little more feasible and doable, um, but it's it's cutting edge. It's it's yeah. really, you know, where the industry can go and, and use of 
uh, very impressive technology, the, the turn-off piece. Okay, so I mean, one of the things that you uh, briefly touched upon with DJ, uh, but I was very interested in this. Uh, I downloaded this document and uh, and uh, read through it myself, and I know that Joe has printed it out, a hard copy. Uh, I am talking about the Cedia slash CTA RP22 Immersive Audio Design Recommended Practices. And uh, I, I wrote up some copy here that I'm actually going to let... Uh, uh, Joe read out for us because I, I took a bunch of screenshots to share. So I'm going to try and keep myself organized as we're going through that. There's a 144 page document. Um, so, you know, but the thing was, it, it's it's not written in like super complicated language. This is written in plain language that anybody who's interested could absolutely understand. It's freely available. So uh, I have a link to uh, a version that you can download if you want to through our link, or you can go directly through CDR through uh, like uh, AV Nirvana, right? They have a link uh, that you can get this freely available. But I'm going to let uh, Joe go ahead and read sort of through what, I, what I've written up, and then he can interject with anything that I've missed or uh, thinks need to be clarified. Yeah, and I'll start out saying this document, I think, was seven years in the making, yeah. really kind of from concept, the last three years working really hard on it. The, the people they had uh, working weekly on this were really some of the industry icons, right? You know, Peter Elat was helping to kind of head this thing up. He's a high-level instructor, CDO designer in the UK. But they had guys from, you know, Dolby and Yamaha and, and a lot of high-end manufacturers. Grimani Systems was part of this. Um, a lot of really reputable designers, but but folks uh, who know it, I think Floyd Tools on you know some of the calls. There were guys from Harman there. It, it's it's people who really know this stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, it's it's not a must do it this way. These are recommended practices sure. to get the best possible results. Yeah, and, so, uh, and we will just say this is uh, this is clearly labeled as version 1.0, uh, and they they make it very clear in the text. There are going to be updates to this thing, so we'll go we'll touch upon a few of those things as we go through here. Yeah. So the crux of the RP22 guideline is the establishment of a four level performance verifiable tier list that covers seating layout, speaker layout, speaker performance, low frequency optimization, sound isolation, acoustic treatment, equipment selection, and calibration. The idea is to establish clear metrics and definitions so that manufacturers, designers, integrators, and consumers can all share a common language and a clear understanding of what is expected for each aspect of a home theater's design. And, and I do love this that up until now, you know, we've all kind of said if, if my front wall speakers can hit 105 dB, I, I might reference, right? So sure. th this, this quantifies like 21 different levels at four different, sorry, 21 different uh, categories mm -hmm. that you'll measure at four different levels. So yeah, really, there were like subsections to each of the main uh, headings that, uh, that uh, named out there, you know, the seating layout has subsections to it. The speaker performance has subsections to it. So yeah, everything's all laid out and designed nicely organized. Yeah. So level one is considered the minimum required to convey the basics of the artist intent. Level two more accurately conveys the artist intent. Level three meets the reference commercial cinema standards and level four is considered the maximum achievable level of performance for any given parameter. And I stealing this from one of the CDA guys that I listened to on another podcast, but he said it's like level one is, you know, your your Toyota. It'll get <laughs> you there. Right? Level two is like a Lexus. It's a okay. bit nicer. Level three is, you know, your higher end sports car, but maybe still with four seats in it that <laughs> is uh to be aspired to. And then level four is like an indie car, right? It's just it's it's almost that unobtainium type level. Sure. So it's, I think that's a good way to kind of think of uh, what you're trying to do as you're designing these systems. There's a useful glossary and an introductory section to start, so it's possible for anybody to read through these guidelines. You don't have to be a professional. Overall, we are happy to note that essentially everything lines up with the existing knowledge and advice that we have been espousing on AV Rant. But we also noted some limitations, and the document itself mentions planned updates for emerging technologies and practices. Yeah, they, they don't get into the uh, modular screens and how you're going to treat a senior channel, right. center channel for that. So, yeah. Uh, we like that there's a focus on balancing the system's attributes and suggesting appropriate compromises that do not overly prioritize one single facet. Uh, but right away, it is clear that the intention and expectation is to use an enclosed rectangular room. And this is a home theater focused design, meaning there's an emphasis on multiple seats and large seating areas. Yeah, I'd, I'd almost take this to the home cinema level, right? This mm -hmm. is, um, you know, people who are 
paying designers to get this right and, and have a way of measuring and codifying all of this so that the results at the end meet the expectations yeah. at the beginning. And it's not a dedicated single seat, two channel only setup. That is not what this is going for. This is home cinema. Yeah, and, and, and I'm jumping around here a little bit, but you do have a uh, what they call an RSP or main listening seating yeah, reference position. Seating reference position seating is position. how they go with it in this document, yeah. And that will get coded to one of these four levels, and then the next adjacent seat to it has to hit that same level for the room to be considered right, that. Right, right. But not yeah. necessarily literally every single seat. Because, Correct. I mean, of course you could put a seat that's going to be closer than five uh, five feet from a wall. That's not going to be the reference seat, but it's, you might have a seat. That's Right. That, so so we, yeah. we talked about you might have, you know, two seats, you know, uh, his and hers that are uh, level three seats. Yeah. And your, your next row might back might be a level two. Right. And so you can do that kind of thing with yeah. it. Uh, and the name of the document also makes it clear that. This is about immersive audio, Dolby Atmos, RO3D, and DTSX, both regular and DTSX Pro. But interestingly, there's a call for a unified speaker layout that isn't limited to prioritizing just one format. And according to Cedia, if you want reference or the maximum achievable, you've got to have at least 15 speakers. <laughs> yeah, that's in the uh, the level three or the level four. Uh, they're like, well, 13 if all you're focused on is Oro 3D, because that's as high as Oro 3D goes is 13. Uh, but 15 is what they have listed there if you're uh, level three or level four. So that'd be your 9.1.6, right? That's what they're you're saying you got to get to in order to reach level three or level four. Level two, though... Uh, is where it's 11 speakers. That's your uh, your 7.1.4. So, I mean, honestly, if we're talking about what a lot of people who listen to this podcast are aiming for, we're going to be in that more level two type of region. In fact, you know, I got no problem with you stopping at 5.1.4 or 5.1.2 even, which wouldn't even necessarily come up to uh, level one as far as spatial resolution goes in this document. But uh, yeah, j just an idea there as far as you can, you can be at, say, a level three in one facet and a level two in another that's not Correct. out of the question yeah um so and what we're talking about is what they're considered parameter 10 decoder renderer capability and discrete rendering speaker configuration excluding the subwoofers and right. yeah so level one it's a five channel system level two is 11 level three is 17 or 13 depending on if it's an oro system and again level four is 17 or 13 you got 17 in yours because I mean the, the one I just downloaded well, from August says 15. So. <laughs> and, and again, I'm I'm reading off of an earlier version. Yeah, so that, yeah. Because be I mean, honestly, there's there's uh, I mean there's not that many to go, that go to 9.1.6, and that there's even fewer that go above that. So <laughs> yeah, uh, very limiting. Okay, so continuing on, we really liked practical, logical suggestions for surrounds and surround back speaker placement, uh, nudging surround speakers up a bit, removing surround backs if. Any of your seats are too close to the back wall, keeping the direction of the sound correct for all of the seats. It's all in here and promotes logical decisions over strict adherence to angles on a diagram. We love it. Yeah, um, uh, we actually went over uh, one little uh, area there, which was a little bit to do with uh, some of the screen setup. Sorry. So we can we can skip our way back there just a little bit. I'd, let me catch back up with my images here. My bad. Uh, no we agree with the viewing angle suggested, but it's made clear that the document will be updated once they figure out exactly what to do with very large micro LED displays. For the moment, the focus remains on acoustically transparent projection screens with traditional center speaker placement. Yeah, so I was I was almost a little bit surprised. I mean, it's very understandable because, like you say, they've been working on this document for quite some time, and the notion that you're going to have absolutely everything right up to the last minute. Uh, at some yeah. point, you got to, uh, like we do for uh, what, what questions we're going to answer this week, there's got to be a cutoff point at something. But I mean, I absolutely envision, yeah, there's going to be a version 1.1 of this or a version 2.0, whatever they, they deem uh, is uh, necessary for going up in the number there. But um, yeah, that, that's going to get added to this because we're seeing quite a few of those micro LED uh, modular displays getting installed in high-end homes right now. And I mean, look, I'm not affording those things. Even Joe might not be affording those things in your own house not just yet. But if we don't have that stuff developed and shown at CDA and CES, it's never going to get down to our price level. So I'm not opposed to having that stuff shown at the, you know, multi hundreds of thousands of dollars. It, that's the starting point. Eventually it's going to reach us. 
Well, even if you're doing a 98 inch screen, where yeah. you're putting that center channel, gets it to be a tricky you know, question. Yeah. Um, there's print. There's pretty strong advocacy for the front wides, and even Rob is willing to admit that, given the way front wide sounds are currently matrixed by the Dolby surround up mixer and the DTS Neural X up mixer, the placement suggestions in this document make the most sense. And I, you know, my understanding of that is wherever your left speaker is and your left side speaker is you measure that and you're in the middle of it yeah yeah and uh, that is the way that the particularly the neural x up mixer uh you know it, it is just basically subdividing the distance between your say front left and surround left and it's like okay the the wide is going to go halfway between those two speakers so yeah i'm willing to go with that because i was pretty staunch on being like I, I, from the experience that I had, felt like it really needed to go at the plus minus 60 degree mark. That's where I had the best experience. But honestly, that was going back to when it was Neo X and mm. uh, Odyssey's version DSX. Um, and, and the processing is slightly different now as, for, as to how uh, the wides get matrixed if you're doing the upmixer version of it. So yeah, I'm perfectly fine slightly, ad slightly adjusting my own recommendations on where exactly your front wide should get placed. Uh, RP22 advocates for aiming and angling overhead and surround speakers, but they note what should be considered when simply flush mounting speakers and having them fire straight down or across. So yeah, they're not saying that uh, you know speakers that are firing straight down are out of the question. Uh, that is still something that you can do with your Atmos speakers, even for your surround speakers. They could be firing straight across the room. Uh, they were just mentioning, as we've always said you know that is with the caveat of you have wide dispersion speakers that you aren't but, using but so, narrow dispersion speakers right wide dispersion right let's let's really yeah. you know look into wh what is the plot map what's the polar map That's of right. that speaker what is it really like I'm, I'm a big believer and you need to angle your speakers towards the listening position i mean i've That's, always gone with there is a cone of dispersion out of a given speaker. Uh, in some, as, as you move yourself uh, off axis, there's really quite a very noticeable change in timbre. You can hear where the tweeter falls off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in some, it's quite gradual, depending on the design of the speaker. But in some, there's almost like a, a, a noticeable line <laughs> that's been drawn. And I'm like, well, it keep the seats that you care about within the cone of dispersion, which probably means there's going to be some angling and aiming. Uh, but it's not that... I don't think you literally, like, it's impossible to have every seat bang on axis. That's just not geometrically possible, so. Well, not bang on, but within the cone, within right? The that's cone. what you're looking within for. If it's cone. a wide so, enough dispersion, you want to hit the entire audience. That's right. I it, never if it, thought that was terribly difficult to understand or agree upon. That's more or less what this document is saying. Uh, so there we go. We're, we're finally got something we can point to and be like, yeah, be within the cone of dispersion. Right, and and if, it's, if your audience or the speaker isn't doing it, you need to change one or the other, right? right? You either need fewer chairs that are inside that cone right. or you need a different speaker. Yeah. It's that easy. Um, sorry, I'm trying to remember where we were. Yeah, uh, where we uh, Speaker 16 performance, YZ. Yeah. yeah. Speaker performance measurements borrow very strongly from Harman's research, and when it comes to reference volume, they're still aiming for 105 dB peaks or more. Mildly surprising is a steadfast two or four subwoofer approach to base optimization. There's certainly no disagreement from Tom and Rob <laughs> but, or Joe, but other than suggestions for more reading in the appendix, the document itself doesn't provide a standardized approach for dealing with non-rectangular rooms. They specifically mentioned that double base array and active room treatment will be studied and added to the guide in the future. Like you said, they had to cut it off at some point, right? That's that right. technology just came out. They started this paper three years ago. That's right. Um, but yeah, absolutely. But I would say if I had a slight disappointment uh, with this, it was um, basically just saying if your room isn't a rectangle... <laughs> If your room is not an enclosed rectangle, like in the appendix, here's some other things for you to read. But there was there wasn't anything standardized in version one of this, and I was slightly disappointed by that because even in really high end installations, there's a lot of rooms that are not perfect enclosed rectangles. So I think, I mean, but it, again, their their recommended practices for right. designing a room yeah. don't design a room with a dog leg if you sure. can help it, right? So. Sure. Uh, of great interest to a lot of our audience will be the sound isolation and room construction section. We can't really say there's any revelatory here. Uh, though the approach to soundproofing is nicely laid out, but there's no magic here. Mass, absorption, damping, and decoupling, uh, and focusing on flanking paths, just like Soundproof Company says, total agreement from us. Yeah. 
one of the really interesting things that they talked about was the, the noise floor at level four is yes. like 15 dB. And that's that's hard to measure. And DJ and I talked about that some. I yesterday. mean, is that really necessary? That's, <laughs> that's what's the, So what's, what's the quietest thing in a movie? Right. Yeah. Well, silence. I suppose, yes. Right? right? If you can't do silence, you're not doing it right. But, I mean, we're talking about having the room's ambient noise level so low that you can start to hear your own internal organs pumping. You know, I mean, it's... But, a- <laughs> but okay, so let's compare that to a dynamic level. You, you're saying a little bit of light's okay in a projected room? No, you want a black room, okay, right? So it's yeah. the same thing with your audio. The, the, the quieter you can get it, the more dynamic range you're I just sort of feel like, like one of the things, one of the slight misgivings I have about this on the... Um, um, man, on the marketing side, not even on the manufacturing side, on the marketing side, is I can envision them starting to put things like Cedia level three, you know, uh, somewhere in the marketing. And it's like, it's going to, because these are guidelines, because these are recommended practices, and this isn't a true standards body with some sort of like uh you know, punishment that they can dole out <laughs> to somebody not like right. strictly adhering right? the home theater police won't come and get <laughs> yeah, you exactly like i can just sort of envision there being products with marketing referencing levels or something like that i'm like ah, oh, man like it's like look for the integrator it's just going to mean yeah they they continue to have to educate their clients but i can i can sort of have a little bit of misgiving about how this could be misused. Yeah. Uh, and I think to me, it's really about codifying a, a, an objectable measurable thing, yes. right? Yeah. So that as, as you're sitting down as an integrator with a client, you're, you're agreeing, okay, we're going to have some seats that'll be at level two, some yeah. that'll be at level three. We're not going to hit level four because we're not charging you $500,000 for right. this <laughs> theater, right? So it's just, it's setting expectations up front and a measurable outcome that you yeah. can agree hits the contract at your, you know, right. price and what you're trying yeah, to yeah, do. Yeah. So yeah, love it. Um, the acoustic treatment section surprised us just a bit uh, as the maximum achievable level calls for what appears to be a pretty darn dead sounding room. And the calibration section was not nearly as long or detailed as we expected. It was downright short generalized. So we could definitely envision a lot of expansion to that section in the future. Again, these are recommended practices for a result you're trying to achieve yes. it's not necessarily how you're going to get that right it's not a result full, in every room yeah technical manual how to guide right yeah, yeah. yeah. and if, if it'd be a hundred and you know it'd be thousands of pages oh, if gosh, it was a, yes. a total yeah. how to no, i just so i'm just it was just things that occurred to me uh mm-hmm. as i was reading through it um but yeah in particular yeah like going for the uh the, the level four if you want to go level four like they have that optimum decay time as a completely flat line, no no slight rise in the bass, which is pretty normal in, in any acoustic space to have some slight rise in the bass in the decay mm. times, uh, but like a completely flat line and like around 0.2 uh you know milliseconds going on, or uh, like, yeah, like uh, 200 milliseconds rather, 0.2 of a second going on. I'm like, I see a lot of people being like, that's a overly damped room. So it was just, it was just curious to me that they would say that's level four. That's the maximum you can achieve is like a really dead room. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say smarter people than I wrote this. So <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to. Me too. Me too. There you go. Well, there we go. I mean, heck, we're almost a whole hour into this thing, but I wanted to go through that. And Joe was the perfect person to go through it with because he's, he's read through that manual. He's uh, consulted on it. And, and yeah, I mean, visited CDS, saw the uh, educational seminars, was part of those. So yeah, no better person to go through that with. So thank you very much for taking the time. Listening uh, my to pleasure. That. And uh, so, yeah, we'll head on in. I uh, just had one comment here that came in from Paul. He just felt oddly excited about his decidedly non-glamorous home theater upgrade. Uh, he had an electrician come in to install his new level two charger for his car in the garage. And while that electrician was there, he had him install a new outlet in his storage area where he hides uh, the back end of his projector. So that's installed up high. Um, it's... Uh, even though that uh, outlet itself is installed up high, it still runs into an APC battery backup for the projector. Uh, but he's he's finally up to code, which feels good. And you know what? I fully agree because there's uh, a little bit of risk not being up to full safety code with anything that you're doing there. So I am happy that you did that, Paul. That's very good. We approve, Paul. Yes, indeed. Well, we're probably going to hand off back and forth here as we're reading through the questions. because That seems like the most logical thing to do. So, uh, yeah, why, why don't you go ahead with the first one there, Joe? Okay, and it is from Paul also, and he's got a multi-part question. So part A, Paul has heard us say quite often that the difference between 1080p and 4K resolution really isn't that big a deal, and that HDR is the bigger visible difference. 
But he, when he went from a 1080p projector to a native 4K resolution Sony projector about five years ago, all on a 92-inch screen, and the improvement has he has seen is not just HDR. So are we mostly talking about just smaller screen sizes not showing the difference because he's noticed an amazing level of detail from native 4K content. So, I mean, look, I'm not going to say there's zero difference from resolution alone. You get close enough. There can be a difference in resolution alone. But I would also say at the very same time, from whatever 1080p projector you went to, to your Sony 4K projector, there can be more than just resolution that improved. If the native panel contrast improved, your eye is going to pick the, that up as a much more detailed image. And I'm not talking about going from standard dynamic range to high dynamic range. I'm just talking about intra-scene contrast, a, a black pixel right next to a white pixel type. <coughs> and if you improved native panel contrast at the same time, then that could have a very major impact on your subjective perception of detail in the image that wasn't necessarily the higher pixel count. Um, yeah, and uh, as well, things with uh, with color, color resolution can have an impact on that. Motion resolution can have an impact on that for sure, because as items are in motion, if you notice something is more legible or the eye edges are better defined in motion that isn't necessarily the resolution doing that it could be to do with the image processing or the native characteristics of the panel so i'm not sure if joe had uh, additional thoughts on that so, so I'll, I'll touch on one thing he said and that was really about screen size right so sure. 92 inch screen those pixels are fairly small you go up to 150 inch screen those pixels are much bigger right. so yeah. Yeah, you, you are going to notice that the bigger you blow it up, the more that 4K <laughs> oh, yeah, is going to make yeah. a difference. Yeah, like a 55-inch TV from 8 feet away, I'm going to still argue that it's that just noticing a pure difference from 1080p to 4K, it's going to be difficult. Like, physiologically, there's evidence that it's difficult to do that. Certainly, right. uh, as you go to the larger and larger screens, uh, assuming you're keeping the seating distance somewhat the same, so your field of view is increasing is what we're getting at, uh, the resolution is going to make more uh, a difference. But I would just say, I think... Yeah, I'm not disagreeing that resolution makes a difference, but I think there are other attributes that could uh, uh, influence your subjective perception of detail uh, just as not much, if not more, than the sheer resolution. I, I agree. You know, none of the 1080p stuff was doing wide color gamut. They weren't right. doing HDR. So th there are elements beyond just the, the resolution, but I do think the resolution can play a part of it as you go larger. Sure. Uh, part B of the question he had originally thought his next projector would be laser-based, but some of the things we said about how you can't replace the laser light engine when it starts to dim made a lot of sense to him. I agree 100%. <laughs> uh, he remembers how the first projector he got back in 2000 had a lamp that only claimed it would last 1,000 hours, and it was dim to begin with. <laughs> now his lamps go for at least 2,000 hours before there's any noticeable loss in power, and with a few picture setting adjustments, he can get them to 3,000 hours quite easily. There's easy to replace and the projector looks brand spanking new with a new bulb in it but we do foresee projector lamps continuing to improve, improve like this will they at least hold steady or will the transition to laser projectors mean the lamps in the coming years might get worse and start to have shorter lifespans hmm. I, I don't think lamp technology is going to go anywhere right it's, it is where it's at the uhd lamp is a pretty mature mm -hmm. technology at this point uh, I agree 100%. I recently bought that NX9 mm -hmm. that I have as a used projector, put a new bulb in it, right. and it's 100% now for me. And in you know, 2,000, 2,500, whatever hours, I'll put another bulb in there, and it'll be back, back to brand new. Uh, DJ and I have talked about the fact that you know he just changes his contrast and brightness settings a little sure. bit every 100 hours or so, and yeah, you can get a consistent level of performance out of a slightly dimming bulb. Yeah, as long as you, um, you know, at the very beginning don't have to completely max out every last uh, facet of it to, right. to get to acceptable, sure. and as soon as it starts dimming, there's there's no uh, so essentially leaving yourself a little bit of headroom in, in terms of light output, but that's going to be usually the case for most of us certainly on a 92 inch screen i'm not particularly worried that he's going to be absolutely maxing out uh any of the 4k projectors that he might be getting as i mean it's pure speculation i i don't really foresee massive changes in all uh uhd lamp technology uhp um ultra high pressure lamp technology i mean look i'd be happy if there were something that made them even more efficient and longer lifespans than that but uh it, yeah i mean i think it's going to be more a matter of standing pat if i were to predict anything i think it's gonna hold pretty steady and i don't foresee 
uh, you know, UHP lamps for projectors like disappearing off the market or becoming, uh, you know, third party only or something like that in the very near future, maybe one day. But uh, but I think we're we're pretty comfortable to still have a lamp based projector today. Yeah, from going from my first in focus 7200 mm -hmm. 720p projector, I started changing out lamps and back then and I've been doing it across multiple projectors for years. Uh, we've been talking about the 98-inch TVs that are starting to get a lot more affordable now. But when, when you watch YouTube videos about all the various TVs out there, it just seems ridiculously complex. <laughs> there are endless models, endless updates, and imperceptible differences that get debated as though they are the end of the world. <laughs> it makes him want to just stick with projectors. I agree. <laughs> uh, so can, can we sympathize? Is the state of the TV reviewers ever going to calm down? Uh, and get easier to understand, and just how crazy bright do people need, want their screens to be anyway. <laughs> I, I, so I agree with you completely. I I like the look of a projected image sure. as, you know, a, a reflected light as opposed to an emitted light. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you are in a light-controlled room, you have a good screen. I, I think projectors have a long lifespan in front of them. Uh, I, I do think that modular displays for multi-purpose rooms or rooms where it's not light controlled uh, definitely make a lot of sense. Uh, but yeah, I, I can totally sympathize. I, I, I haven't shopped for an 98 inch screen. I've listened to you guys talk about them also. But yeah, it's it's complicated. Well, yeah, I mean, on one hand, I would argue a little bit that I, I don't think the projector model landscape is dead simple. I mean, you've got multiple different uh, technologies just in the imaging chips themselves, you know, DLP, LCD, liquid crystal on silicon, liquid crystal on quartz, uh, you know, there are... There are yeah, that there are differences there. Um, you've got now different lamp technologies. Even if you just focused on laser lamps, you've got some that are the triple laser. You've got some that are the double the laser. Blue. You know, uh, blue with a yellow phosphor that's also being activated. So I mean, look, there's there's minutia to get into there. What is obvious is there are just in sheer number fewer projector models than there are TV models. I don't think that's debatable whatsoever. So I can agree with you there, but I don't I don't know that if you were to dig into all the variations of projector technology that it's it's really vastly less and different and easier to understand than the differences in modern day flat panel technology. Um so maybe it's just that, you know, being a projector fan, you've kept up with that a little bit more. And uh, when you go over to the TV land, you're like, oh, I, you know, the last time I looked at these, they were all edge lid LED LCD TVs or something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah. But, but, but JVC's got, what, six projectors in their lineup oh, yes. that you really yeah. look at. Oh, yeah. Sony's Sheer got, what, five? Models, no question. Maybe, yeah. yeah, it's just, you know, it's, it's a entry. It's a good, better, best, extra sure. bestest, right? So it's, uh, I, I think projectors are a little bit easier to wrap your head around what the differences are between the different levels. I guess so. Yeah, I don't know. I, I can sympathize somewhat, but I don't think I'm fully on board with that. I think there's plenty of detail to go through in projectors, too. <laughs> well, I, I, can't, I can't keep track of all the LG OLEDs, let alone all the other options out there. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the just how crazy bright do people want their uh, TVs to get? I, I am on board with you there because look, like... I have, I still have my 75 inch Sony Z9D, um, but that, you know, that got pretty bright at the time. It was one of the brighter TVs that you could get as far as full array local dimming LCD TVs go. And I'm like, when I have my theater, not even pitch black, when I still have bias lighting going on in there, there are some HDR scenes where I, my eyes literally squint. Like it's just a, an autonomic response. And I'm like, that's 1200 nits from my Z90. Do, do I need 10,000? <laughs> Is that honestly? Like, I don't really want to squint when I'm watching a movie or a TV show. So I'm I'm on board with you there. I, I, th that's one where Vincent Tio and I diverge a little bit. I agree with almost absolutely everything. If you're talking about when are the reviewers going to calm down, I mean, you know, I pick Vincent Tio first if I'm going to listen to anybody. There's others that I like too. Uh, but, you know, I, I like his very technical reviews. But yeah, we diverge a little bit because he's, he's all about getting up to 10,000 it's he wants those specular highlights right up there and real life images and i'm like i get where you're coming from i just never want to squint <laughs> right and and honestly you know i've got a panasonic plasma downstairs that is in a room that's got you know sliding glass door yeah. alongside of it and that tv is almost always watched in a brighter more lit than the theater is sure. up here so yeah last one from paul uh, when the upgrade, sorry, when he upgraded his projector to a genuine 4K model, he also upgraded his receiver and cables to all be able to handle 4K. It felt, it felt worth it at the time. 
He also expanded from 5.1 to 7.1, but he honestly doesn't feel the surround back speakers have been worth it. Blasphemy. <laughs> when he checks out coverage of AVR, sorry, AV receivers these days, uh, it seems to be all about adding even more speakers and having more and more HDMI bandwidth. Part of him feels like he should be keeping up with the Joneses, but if he takes a step back, is there actually anything compelling that should be convincing him to get a new AV receiver today? <laughs> Taking a line from Lee, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So, well, I mean, it, if you've got a Sony 4K projector, uh, even if you got the one of the newest ones, which we know he doesn't because he's using the lamp based model, so I mean, but even the newest ones are topping out at 4K 60, so they're not doing 4K 120 yet. So, there's no incentive for you on a personal level to go to an AV receiver that has a bunch of HDMI 2.1 switching, you literally don't have a display to make use of that. <laughs> Honestly, even if you did, unless you're a high-end gamer who's outputting 4K 120 from one of the newest consoles or a PC, there isn't really a need. So on the HDMI side, I'm going to say, nope, there's not a compelling reason for you to upgrade your AV receiver on the HDMI side of things. And like, I completely agree that if you are satisfied with 5.1 or 5.2, you can have a very, very good surround sound experience with a 5.2 setup and telling you you must spend... and to get, look to get to you can hit level one all day long absolutely yeah you know to, to get to uh four overhead speakers you're spending at least over a thousand dollars these days for an av receiver so like if you're like look i added surround backs i didn't even super duper appreciate those what are overhead speakers like are they is it going to be transformative i wouldn't i would never uh, say that yeah so i would argue that immersive audio adding overhead does add a different element to yeah. the experience than you've ever had before. So if that's something you're considering, I would listen to some demos, see if you mm. feel like it's worth it. Uh, if it's not worth it to you, yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, um, don't feel bad for being satisfied with 5.1. Like, right, so, you're, you're not insane for being uh, satisfied with that. <laughs> 100%. My, my Denon receiver downstairs is God, it's probably 10, 12 years old, and sure. it works fine for a 5.1 application yeah. with a 1080p plasma. And so, yeah. Haven't bothered upgrading. Do Honestly, I feel like I need I to keep up? Yeah. In his case, I think when the need to upgrade your AV receiver, it will reveal itself. You will. It's end when up you want to do something different. Yeah, you when will you end up with a display and a source at some point where your AV receiver becomes a bottleneck to that signal, and it's going to be more hassle to try and work around what you already have than it would be to replace it with the newest thing, and it's going to reveal itself as being the optimal time for you. Right. If you want to do immersive, then you're trying to do something different and you'll need a different product yeah. at that time. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, also, he still has a Harmony remote and everything in his system works perfectly with it right now. He's a bit afraid that getting something new might undo his current stable <laughs> remote control scheme. Do we have any thoughts on all of that? Start buying Harmonies and stacking them up, baby. They'll... <laughs> Just, all you need to do is move the program from one to the next. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think he's just sort of feeling like, shouldn't I want to upgrade? I'm like, no, you don't have and, to feel like that. And, and that's that's something in this hobby that the, the lust for new gear is always there, right? There's always Absolutely. something better. I look at my AV8805 over there, and I'm yes. like, gosh, it's not as nice and new as the AV10. The AV10, Why, there you, know? you go. But then I have to remind myself, what am I missing out on, right? Two more speakers in the ceiling? Yeah, do I really need to do that? you got to have the 4K 120 and a source to use it, and then you'll have a right. reason to go to your AV10 there, Joe. Yeah, and I just and the, the four subwoofer outputs, yeah, I'm not going to go that route <laughs> on this one. But So I, I hear you, you know. It, yeah. it's, it's don't definitely... feel bad. Don't feel bad. That's why you came to us, because we're one of the few places that's going to tell you don't feel bad for not needing or wanting to upgrade right now. You've got what sounds like a very nice home theater system. And if, if you're happy with it, it's right for you. Exactly. Right. So we have a question uh, here from Infinite Gary. Uh, yep. Gary was playing the commentary track on a Blu-ray. He didn't think it was recorded particularly well, and the person's voice sounded very chesty. So he has his center speaker, which is a Revel uh, Voice 2. Very nice. nice speaker. Yeah. Ultima 2 series there. Uh, set too small with a 65 hertz crossover that seems to work best in his setup. Uh, to counter the sound quality of this particular commentary track with the chesty vocals, he temporarily used the bass tone control on his Anthem Pre-Pro and lowered the bass tone control to negative 12. Uh, but what exactly does that adjustment do to the signal? Is it just reducing the volume of certain frequencies? And are those frequencies then getting rerouted anywhere else when he does that? Um, so yeah, do you want to go ahead and take that one, Joe? 
Yeah, that just sounds like it's doing it. It's a level cut is basically what you're doing when you're pulling that down. I'm not sure exactly where their bass tone control is centered or how wide the cue is on that particular yeah. band, but you're just dropping the level on that part of the signal. Yeah, I mean, usually you will see it. It's like going to be a range from about 50 to 250 hertz is pretty typical. Some are a little higher or lower on either end of that. Often centered around 120 hertz is, is quite typical. Again, might be a little higher or lower where that's centered. But it's basically like applying a fixed parametric EQ, like where they've decided what the Q width and what the center frequency is going to be. You don't get to adjust that for yourself uh, in the bass tone control, but it's basically just applying, yeah, like a saddle curve in your case. And that sound is not getting rerouted anywhere else. It's not a form Correct. of bass management. Because uh, you're not cutting it out of the signal. Yeah, you're yeah. just dropping I mean, it. It's like it's like lowering the volume, but only on a certain One spot. Uh, uh, section of frequencies. That's all you've done. So yeah, doing that temporarily, perfectly fine for a commentary track. I'm not particularly worried that I'm miss missing out on some reference sound that's vital. Like you're already overlaying the commentary track. So what's important there is the vocal, and I'm, I have no beef with doing that on a temporary basement uh, basis. Now, now, now conversely, if he brought his crossover point up to say 120 hertz to get mm. rid of that, that would have been rerouted. Yes, that's right. Yeah, if you had altered the crossover point, then and then say turn down the subwoofer, uh, that that would have been perhaps another way to get around this. But that would have altered what frequencies are getting routed to which speakers. Uh, so the second question and last from Infinite Gary: uh, What has changed in the projector world just recently that's now allowing for these officially supported Dolby Vision projectors? Um, yeah, so. I, I'm not actually sure. Did you have any insight on that from Cedia? That, that get into that? No, that, I, and I didn't really look at any of that. You're seeing a lot of the Chinese manufacturers that are mm -hmm. starting to support that. The you know, I, I I'm curious to see if you know the Sony's or the JVCs uh, yeah. get to that level. I, mean, it sure I know seems like the JVCs have everything necessary. No, to, their, to, their their software continues to improve. Yeah. Uh, firmware, their capabilities. I wonder if they'll uh, ever claim that capability. So yeah, I. I no, I'm, I'm not sure if that's uh, a marketing thing that, uh, you know, <laughs> well, is allowing I mean, for Dolby Vision support. What I did see in that AWOL Vision one, the first one that's claiming to be a long throw Dolby mm -hmm. Vision certified projector, uh, is that they did mention that they have the, the in, in the setup menu, the ability to enter the gain of your screen, the size of your screen, and it's going to know from its zoom ratio, the, the you know, the, uh, the approximate distance from the screen. So just having those as part of the setup menu, which wasn't there before. Most projectors didn't have that. The JVC uh, do. JVC Theater. In, optimizer, in their theater yeah. optimizer, which again is why I'm thinking, yeah, maybe they'll be able to just firmware update to add Dolby Vision support at some point. But that for you know just standard projectors is is a bit new in the settings menu. So I would think that's a part of it for the ultra short throw ones that like come with a screen like high senses, so it's a fixed throw ratio. They're gonna know what the light output and what the screen is because it came bundled with it. So I think right. that all helps in being able now what. Dolby and the projector still don't know is your ambient light level. Now, maybe they have a little light sensor. You know, a lot of our TVs and projectors have a little ambient room light sensor. Those aren't necessarily the most accurate thing, but I suppose it can give some indication. So I can see how... I, I don't think any of these are going to be the optimal version of Dolby Vision at home, but it's just going to be that at least there's some parameters where, you know, you can make adjustments to say, okay, I'm not... I'm seeing the highlight detail get clipped and there's an adjustment I can make and maybe I can just fudge it and say my screen is larger than it is or something like that. Right, and, But you're still tone way. mapping to, yeah. you know, 200, 400 nits. You're, yeah. you're not hitting 10,000 nits Definitely on the projector. Not. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, next question from Greg. Greg came across an ad for the nice HR40 Universal Remote. That's a much friendlier kind of a model number. Uh, he liked the look of it, but didn't have any other information about it. Do we know anything worth sharing? So you have some links here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, these are just links to uh, back up some of the notes that I found, because honestly, I wasn't super familiar with uh, NICE as a company or this HR40 Universal Remote in particular. Uh, but NICE is an Italian brand uh, founded in 1993. They began with uh, gate and garage door automation. Uh, then they've acquired several brands over the year, especially after they got listed on the Italian stock exchange, went public uh, that way and uh, had an influx of money there. So they now own Furman and High Security and Abode and other companies as 
well. So some well-known brand names there that are now under the nice umbrella. Uh, one of the other companies they acquired in 2022, they completed their acquisition of Nortec Control, which was the parent company of Elan and Speakercraft and Panamax at the time. So all of those brands are now under the nice umbrella. So the HR40 itself, it was part of the Elan home automation system. It still has some of the Elan branding on there. And the uh, MSRP is $1,200 and it does need to be professionally installed as part of an Elan home automation system. So if you were thinking, oh, this is a nice hard button and touchscreen combo remote to replace my Harmony, it's a different price class and a different installation. It's not a DIY and it's not a couple hundred dollars. So if you were hoping for that, uh, that's the bad news there. <laughs> And I've noticed that over the last few years, uh, more and more of the conglomeration or c commoditization of the industry that we're seeing brands, Massimo owns a whole bunch of them, Indeed, right? Yes. This nice company owns a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, the parent company, it was, uh, I'm trying to remember who it is, but that's above Pioneer and Integra and a couple yes. of other brands. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just a lot of these are getting all scooped up and joined mm -hmm. together. And it, it makes sense that... You know, share the R and D, share the expense, yeah. you know, the engineering, all that. Um, but, but there is just, always I, the, the worry that it's it's going to be run more for the shareholders at some point. And the business, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, yeah. there's concerns there. But I mean, Nice as a company has always been very focused on home automation. So mm -hmm. at least that is somewhat comforting, right? They're not like a, a group of shareholders that just came together to buy something they think they can flip for a profit. It's like, no, right. they Ag are a home automation company. Agreed. It's not venture capitalists or anything like That's that. Right. But, but Speakercraft, you know, especially yeah. in the CDA channel, was a huge partner no there for kidding. the integrators for a lot of years. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just interesting to see how the market has changed. Indeed. So, uh, Kiran in India has written into us, uh, Kiran noticed a bunch of YouTube videos suggesting the usage of near-field subwoofers. Several of them immediately look like overkill with, like, four 18-inch subs on the front wall and then another oh. bunch of 18-inch subs firing directly into the back of the couch. Uh, but since they made him at least a little bit curious, he tried putting his 10-inch subwoofer directly beside his sofa to see just what all the fuss was about, and and he just found it totally distracting. Uh, it did physically shake his couch, and he's just wondering, is is that all these near-field subwoofer people are after? Is violent physical shaking? How and why would that be considered a bragging right? <laughs> well, I think it's the back massage, really. It's, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> I mean... I, I do suspect that quite a few of the, the big, big, big fans of this are coming from the car audio side of things. Um, which Guilty. Is, you know, it is not going for linearity, is not going for uh, absolute accuracy to the original signal. In the car audio world of bass, you are going for sheer SPL and tactile feeling to it. And, and I do think there's a crowd um, that is interested in, you know, these massive amount of subwoofers and some of them very close to your chair that are interested in just the sheer violent shaking of it and not accuracy to the signal. So, but, but I will point out that, you know, with the 10-inch subwoofer, you're not getting as much really low frequency. You're, you're sure. probably getting that shaking in the, you know, the 40 to 60 Hertz range. Oh, yeah. With the 18s, you might be getting that uh, tactile sense from, you know, that 20 Hertz or, or lower the type of rumble bass. the jelly in your eyes type of yeah. thing. Uh, there is some of that, but yeah, I mean, so going all the way back to like when HSU had their mid bass module, you know, which was a frequency limited, the idea of, of basically just turning a, a, a three way system into a four way system or a four way system into a five way system. Um, you know, and the idea that you put the mid bass module, interestingly, having that one physically close to your seats and then having the even lower subwoofer that was playing below 60, 50 Hertz, having that one in a corner or something like that. Um, like we just ran into the immediate issue of that is not the same as a multi subwoofer setup. Right, you're with, getting out of phase, time delayed issues, all kinds of different and seat to seat non uniformity yeah. in particular. And you can definitely run into some of that with this near field subwoofer setup as well, where you start to get non uniformity from seat to seat because the focus isn't on having multiple full range subwoofers playing a mono signal to get you uniformity, not necessarily tremendously higher SPL or tactile concussiveness, but just uniformity. That isn't the goal necessarily when you're going for one of these near field setups. I mean, honestly, my personal take is if what I want is more concussive tactile feeling, I would rather go the tactile transducer route. Bish. 
shaker, right? Sure. Yeah, you know, put put a put a butt shaker into my seat or into the platform that my seat is sitting on, and get pure tactile, uh, you know, feedback that way, which I can dial up independently of the entire rest of my system if I really just want to get physically hit in the back. And, um, you know, something that's always kind of bothered. I've done bass shaker, you know, sure. uh, on on platforms in my own theaters in the past, but the fact that you get as much out of the special effects, right, whether it's the dinosaur stomping or whatever it is, the soundtrack does it also, right? And that's something that kind of, I, I don't want the music to be as tactile. I want to be mm. special effects to be more tactile. And it's, you can't decide. It's bass is bass. So. Yeah, it's just going by the frequency. It, it, it's not separating those things. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not a huge fan of the, the near field approach overall, just because I still want good seat to seat uniformity. And it's difficult to optimize for both at the mm -hmm. same time, <laughs> I mean, well, it's, 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 it's kind of like D box also, right? Sure, you know, sure, it's, sure. it's that physical shaking of the chair that I would not personally want as I'm trying to mm. sit and enjoy a movie. Some people are into it. I will you know, absolutely say the, the horsey bouncing drives me crazy and they love to use it. God, do they love to use the horsey bouncing in the right, or, or, or the Harry Potter riding on a broom or, That's you right. know, motorcycles or, you know, like, and some people, it brings them more into the experience and that's mm -hmm. great for them. I, Person wants to sit and watch my movie. But yeah. So I'm I'm closer to your approach, Kiran, for sure. I, I am not a f uh, personal fan of the violent uh, physical shaking, and I definitely wouldn't want to sacrifice uh, accuracy, linearity, and uniformity of my audible base just to get me more tactile. If if I want more tactile, I'm going to go for a tactile transducer. That would be my approach. Or just um, more bigger subwoofers. I suppose, yes. Right. <laughs> I think it's your turn, right? You're reading the next one? We're, and we're new for this week. We're on to new questions, <laughs> finally. <laughs> uh, Jim. Jim was reading through SVS's webpage about mixing sealed and ported subwoofers, and he found one aspect in particular very interesting. They noted that with their front ported subwoofer design, the sound was sorry, the sound waves coming out of the port are not in phase with the sound waves being generated by the driver, except right at the port's resonant frequency. So when you pair that ported design with a sealed subwoofer, you could encounter some out of phase cancellations that would not exist if you were to use two identical subs. How much of a concern is this? And I think one thing I just to mention, yeah, if you think about, if you've got a sealed subwoofer, mm -hmm. you're entirely containing the the negative pressure the back wave yep. on the subwoofer when, when you're using a ported version of that mm -hmm. you're using a tuned port like a musical instrument to play more of the bass and and recycle some of that energy off the back of the woofer mm -hmm. and then combining it with the front uh, output on the woofer so yeah you, you run into phasing issues at certain frequencies yeah uh yeah so uh, it, it exists um i mean some of this is to do what exactly what frequency are we talking about? Uh, because, mm -hmm. like, for example, with SVS's ported subwoofers, the, the tuning frequency of that port is pretty darn low. Now, that isn't yeah. necessarily the case with every ported subwoofer out there. There were some where the tuning of the port is, you know, up around 35 hertz. That's not that uncommon. On SVS's, the, the tuning of that port is pretty darn low. Uh, so at and, that, and you can adjust that depending on port plugs and everything. You know, if it's at 16 right. hertz, 19 hertz, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So at that point, we're getting into well, predominantly until we start approaching the tuning port, uh, the tuning frequency of that port. Predominantly, the subwoofers are working in whatever phase relationship we've set up, given the phase knobs and distances and orientation and uh, delays and all those types of things. Predominantly, until we start approaching that port tune frequency uh they, they are working in a um a stable phase relationship now that doesn't mean there aren't still some in phase and out of phase uh wave forms that uh, uh wave patterns that are forming because we're still within an enclosed room uh so you're going to have base sound waves that are interacting with each other and forming uh phase relationships and sound wave patterns that is that is definitely going to happen but if the tuning frequency of the port is really quite low until we start approaching it. You've got a, at least a stable phase relationship between the sound producing items in your room. So I would say as long as the tuning frequency of the port is quite low, it is a very slight concern. It's, it's not something where I'd be like, I absolutely must not do this because of my concern for the phase relationship. But if you have a much smaller, less capable ported subwoofer, uh, then yeah, that's yeah. going to start to come into a factor. But then at the same time, 
you're probably not going to have either of your subs at that point really delving down to 20 hertz. They're probably going to fall off a cliff at 30 hertz or something like that. And you almost avoid the issue that way as well. And, and keep in mind that our ears are remarkably unsensitive to yes. distortion and those kind of issues in the lower frequencies. And as you can... Tom likes to point out, if you ended up with a phase cancellation, so at a particular frequency you are not hearing that sound, uh, maybe not at all or at least not as loud as the signal called for, how often are you actually going to be aware of that when it's down at 24 hertz or something? Like the absence of a sound is awfully hard to notice if you don't know it was supposed to be there. Uh, next question. Wouldn't the same issue arise when using ported speakers? The crossover from the speakers to the subwoofer is not a brick wall. So wouldn't there be phase matching issues right in the crossover region where the tuning frequency of the port on the speakers would be coming into play? Is that one reason why THX certified speakers have predominantly called for a sealed design? So I think that's a good point. Uh, and you're not wrong. Uh, that is certainly going to be up more into the range that our human hearing is a little bit more uh, attuned to noticing. Um, and, and I mean, yeah, the, the phase relationship between what is coming out of a speaker and what is coming out of your subwoofers, there there is going to be in that crossover. I mean, there's a lot of issues in the crossover region, to be honest, which is why we, uh, you know, focus so much on, yeah, we want some nice bass trapping in the room to help ameliorate some of the room effects in the crossover region specifically. Uh, it Some of the crossover... Um, mm, most of the crossover region is still going to be below the room's transition frequency. So we're still predominantly talking about sound waves that have reflected off a wall or, or two before they ever actually get perceived by our brain. Uh, but yeah, th there is some of this, which is one of the reasons why um, some of the more generalized advice for where should I set the crossover for given speaker A or given speaker B sometimes looks at the negative 3 dB point or the negative 6 dB uh, point or the port tuning frequency and says, okay, set the crossover at least 10 hertz higher than that, 10 or 20 hertz higher than that point so that electrically we're rolling off the sound before we get to that problematic phase area, um, at which you know might result in you setting your crossover to 120 hertz or something like that if the port tuning frequency is closer to 90 or something like that. And it also depends on how big of a speaker you're talking about. Are we yes. talking a bookshelf speaker or a tower speaker? And right. where is that port tuned to? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, it is a concern, but uh, it's actually one of the reasons why I like the ability of some AV receivers or like what you can do now with Multi-QX if you add that on to one of the modern Denon or uh, Marantz receivers, uh, the ability to implement a steeper slope on the high pass filter that is rolling off the bottom end of your speaker. Because uh, by default, a lot of times that is just a second order, uh, 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 12 decibels per octave slope on the bottom end of the speaker, which means that, you know, that's not a terribly steep slope that's often being applied there, which means you might inch your crossover frequency even higher uh, if you're running into any issues there. So I like the idea that now we can uh, put in a fourth order slope, a steeper 24 decibel per octave slope on there and electrically just avoid this issue. <laughs> we're, we're quieting the base end of the speaker before we ever get to where this is a problem. Uh, is the, So we didn't really touch on this, but is that one reason why DHX certified speakers have predominantly called for a sealed design? Uh, and, and that has to do more with power handling and dynamics yeah. capability, yeah. right? So, again, we talk about a sealed box it is a air suspension, right? You have a set amount of air inside there, and then as that uh, mid-range or base driver is moving in and out, it is either, you know, sucking a vacuum inside of that or it's got air it's trying to compress. It's mm -hmm. moving the other direction. That will help to increase your power handling on a given speaker, um, you know, depending on what kind of output you're looking for from a speaker, the size of the cabinet has a lot to do with that, but that will also impact power handling, uh, how much uh, thermal compression you're going to run into. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different other factors, uh, but, but a seal is going to give you typically um, higher power handling, um, I don't want to say tighter, but you know, it, it more predictable <laughs> results. Uh, right. than, I think than it's more the predictability ported, than anything yeah. else that had them leaning that way. And then, by default, you're going to have something closer to a second-order roll-off on the bottom of a sealed speaker, which then cascades with the second-order roll-off applied by the AV receiver's crossover, and you end up with that fourth-order uh, fourth roll-off with the natural uh, acoustic property of the sealed speaker cascading with the electrical property. So a lot of that design came in that way. And I, 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 I'm not going to say that uh, the phase relationship in the crossover region wasn't any part of it, but I think more of what Joe said was predominantly the reason that they went that way. 
Next part. So he's still a bit confused about the topic of physically rotating a front firing subwoofer and physically altering the phase between two subwoofers that way versus base being omnidirectional and just wrapping around the subwoofer's cabinet to reflect off of all of the room surfaces before we ever actually hear it. How can both things be true at the same time? So I think if you just visualize, uh, like uh, think of a bathtub and you get yourself two spatulas and you just start making waves in your bathtub, right? Now, if you do that with the two of them going at exactly the same time, you're going to see a wave pattern form in your bathtub. There's going to be reflections off of the edges of your bathtub that then come back to the waves that you're creating with your two spatulas. But if you then start altering the timing, of those two spatulas. That's what you're doing with either adjusting the fully variable phase knob or adjusting the delay that your AV receiver is applying to one but not the other, or physically rotating the subwoofer. You're still altering the timing relationship between when one thing is, in the case of like the spatulas in the bathtub, pushing down versus coming up, or in the subwoofer pushing out versus pulling in, you're altering that timing between the two things of when one is pushing out in a given direction or pulling in. So you're not eliminating the reflections, <laughs> that's still happening. You're not changing the fact that the sound is wrapping around the cabinet of the subwoofer and you're going to hear just as much behind the subwoofer as you are in front of the subwoofer but what you are changing is the pattern of the waves that gets created because there's now this difference between the exact timing between the two things making the ripples in the water or making the ripples in the air now I'm just picturing Rob in his bathtub with spatulas and rubber duckies and stuff. Go. Sorry. Um, <laughs> one of the other things to think about, too, is that we we try and think of it as a waveform, as a very linear thing. But right. this is a radiating pattern, yes. right? So it's coming it's out spiritually. <laughs> and it's hard for our brains really yeah. to kind of picture and understand exactly, uh, you know, when, when we're seeing a lot of these online tutorials, demonstrations, mm -hmm. uh, or even in some of the classes, they're, they're representing it as a sinusoidal waveform, right. but it's not that. It's it's and it's even beyond dropping a rock into water or spatulas. It is. Yeah. It's 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 you know, it's like a balloon popping and sending air in every right. direction kind of a thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next question. What about dipole speakers like DevTechs that have drivers firing in phase on both the front and back of the speakers? Are there cancellations out of phase concerns with those? Or what about mirages on the polar speakers? Again, if if a bipole speaker, you're, you're pushing in both directions mm -hmm. at the same time, but you're, you're, you're pushing at the same time. So that is that, that sound is entering in it the environment in an in-phase way. Yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, are there some concerns with you haven't treated the wall that is behind the speaker? So like if we're talking to front speaker, we're talking about the front wall, but the speaker, the wall that is physically closest to the back of the speaker, right. you haven't treated it or whatever. So there's sound emanating out the front and the back in phase with each other. Is there some concern that the reflection off of the wall, when it bounces off that wall and comes back and interacts with the wave that was already moving forward from the front face and also interacting with the wave that is be being generated backwards by those back facing drivers? Like, can you get some reflection sound wave cancellation? Yes, you can. Uh, you can get that off of a, uh, a monopole speaker too, though, because some of that sound energy is still going backwards it, as well. And that has a lot to do with, depends on how far that speaker is from the wall. Wall, right yep. so if you're a one foot from the wall at one kilohertz you're going to be yeah, yeah potentially the reflection could be out of phase with the uh, source of the sound itself mm -hmm. because uh speed of sound is 1130 so a one kilohertz wave is about one foot more or less yeah like a 1.1 1 .1 kilohertz wave is pretty darn close to being a one foot wavelength right um, but, but, but yeah. there you're you're, you're moving you're not all the way out of the mid-range frequencies. You're, you're kind of in the middle of it, but it, well, it that's just it. I mean, it, in here we are talking very much about frequencies that are above the transition frequency of the room. So now we are getting into sounds that we are hearing the direct line that came from the speaker driver to our ear, and we aren't hearing only reflected sound ever uh, when we're talking not, about not only, like, but still predominantly. You're, yeah. I mean, you're. 80% of the sound you're probably hearing is what's getting bounced off the wall from the, all that energy being spread everywhere. But you, you are getting a direct, like, like bipole tweeters or something, you're, you're getting a direct sound uh, coming from that speaker. So yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons why we don't, necessarily go gaga over omnidirectional or bipole speakers or open back 
open baffle back speakers that are are throwing just as much sound out the back of the speaker as they are out the front of the speaker they they tend to be very picky about placement because there are stronger reflections off of that wall that's directly behind that speaker than a traditional monopole speaker right so um and, and if you go ahead and heavily treat that front wall i mean you've almost negated the point of buying the speaker to begin with <laughs> right and, and i have uh, a pair of martin logan's for my two right. channel listening and if i stand alongside of those yeah there's right. a huge amount of cancellation because yeah because that's a dipole at that point they are out of phase front to back so yeah i mean it's <laughs> It's a, you're right, it's it's a little bit tricky to understand, but once we get into the more directional sound, you are dealing with, well, how do I deal with this additional reflection being generated by this speaker? Do I absorb it? And therefore, why did I buy the speaker in the first place? Or do I have to contend with the fact that at some frequencies, given the distance from driver to wall, I'm going to have created new sound wave interactions that wouldn't be there, or at least wouldn't be there as strongly with a monopole speaker. Yeah, and I think that, Especially for front speakers, bipoles are harder to predict what you're going to get yeah. as a result. So, and kind of going back to that THX using sealed speakers, it, it's easier to predict uh, results. Next part of the question What about dual opposed subwoofer designs where there are two subwoofer drivers on either side of one cabinet? Mm -hmm. Isn't that sort of like having two subwoofers with one facing forward and one facing backward? What happens to the sound waves in that scenario? Uh, again, those are wired so that you're, you're pushing sound in a positive way or a negative way out of both mm -hmm. drivers at the same time. So no, that, that that's not going to be out of phase. It's, it's entering again, hemispherically into the room in an in phase way. Yeah. But yeah, honestly, if you, if you did take two subwoofers and you, you stacked them one facing forward, one facing back um, and, and firing, you know, exactly together, it's not, tremendously dissimilar in terms of the the sound wave that's coming out so i mean in all scenarios generating bass because we're in a room and we're not outdoors or in an anechoic chamber there is going to be a sound wave pattern that gets established in that room but we can slightly alter what that exact sound wave pattern is going to be by altering the phase relationship between two subwoofers by altering the delay by altering the timing or by altering the orientation well, but you're still I mean, going to have a wave pattern that gets established think about some of the procella or jbl or you know some of the sound reinforcement where you've got two subwoofers in a cabinet that almost face each yeah. other yeah. right they're both pushing at the same time yeah. and all the sounds coming out to you yeah so uh, it's it's not that there is zero difference occurring, right? Like if you take your subwoofer and you turn it around to face the other way, a front facing subwoofer, it's not that there's zero difference that occurred. It's just that there will still be a sound wave pattern in your room. You've slightly altered it. And now you are going to go through the rest of your base management and setup and calibration to deal with the sound wave pattern you have now, as opposed to the sound wave pattern you had before. Next question. Yeah. Parker. Parker built a dedicated home theater room in his basement. Uh, it's a 14 by 19 by 9. I've got very similar dimensions for two of those. The walls were constructed with insulation inside of them, and he has acoustically treated the walls and ceiling inside the theater with absorption panels and base traps. But above the ceiling drywall, the joist bays are empty, and he has noticed that sound from the theater manages to leak upstairs to the room above. <laughs> Do we think it would be worth the considerable hassle and expense to open up the theater ceiling and stuff it with insulation? Would it make an appreciable difference? First off, let me say this is a really nice looking room. Uh, uh, I like the color scheme. Yeah, uh, the red and black work well together. Good looking chairs on a riser. Uh, no, don't do this. You, you do not well, want not, to tear down your ceiling. Yeah, not and just stuff that. it with insulation <laughs> to try and. Uh, it won't give you the results you're looking for. No, I even thought, you know, could you take down some of your uh, in-ceiling speakers and blow insulation in? But it's it's not going to do what you want no. because, uh, and I don't know if you have back boxes on your in-ceiling speakers. That, mm -hmm. that may be an issue. And he's but, got pot lights too. I mean, this is a uh, right. like a two-tiered ceiling where the, the uh, middle of the ceiling is higher. So he's kind of got basically got a, a perimeter soffit going around the entire thing. So maybe... It's fully drywalled above, and then the soffit is sort of like a false soffit. It's it's not actually there for constructural reasons, but just to hold his lights and that. Maybe that's what he did. Maybe it isn't. I'm not exactly sure. Right. Uh, but there is the possibility that above the soffit as well is just open joist. So he's got pot lights. He's got in-ceiling speakers. So there could be genuine flanking paths going on there. Right. So I was going to say that flanking paths are an issue, right? How is that sound 
but it also structural vibration here, right? The, yeah. the, the base does insulation is going to do anything for the low base. So no. I, I want to know what kind of sounds are you hearing from the upstairs, you know, as, as it's leaking through, is that mid range, is that low base, mm-hmm. you know, what, what, but, but to get this to stop, yeah, you're going to have to pull that ceiling down and you'd be looking at, uh, again, you know, decoupling it, uh, yes. additional layers, uh, of drywall and green glue. Yeah. It's going to be a, a big effort. Um, you're and also going to need to put lower your ceiling height somewhat. A there, little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to need to put cans or boxes behind every penetration of that ceiling. Yeah. Right. So, uh, anywhere that you've got a speaker going through, um, you know, it, it kind of goes back to if you want the room within a room approach or, <laughs> or, you know, the way that they recommend that you, if you're going to go for a sound, tight type of a room is Mm -hmm. you're building a drywall aquarium with no holes in it right and anywhere you're putting a hole you do that below the 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 drywall envelope right so if you you drop things down uh you put in channels or soffits or things that but you never ever penetrate that 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 drywall layer because that's what's going to let sound through yeah so i mean like he mentioned you know like the, the hassle and expense of taking down the current ceiling and putting insulation. I'm like, if you were willing to take the ceiling down, then it's a matter of spending even more and really beefing up the ceiling. Like to take the ceiling down to do nothing but put insulation into the joy space and then put a single layer of drywall back up, completely not worth it. There is no way I would recommend you spending that money and time to just do that. But if you were going to drop the entire ceiling in here anyway, then there is the consideration of, well, I can really beef up the ceiling. I can now put in sound clips and hat channels to hold two layers of drywall with a damping layer in between them and insulation in the joy space too, but I can hit all four of the soundproofing tenets instead of just one. Um, you know, like like what I'm saying, if you're going to do it, you go whole hog. <laughs> but you're still, you're still not going to decouple the frame of the room from the rest of the house. Right, no, so I mean, yeah, you've still you've still got the the paths of the walls themselves being attached to the joists. But I mean, if you fully beefed up the ceiling and decoupled the ceiling itself, I mean, certainly for the vocal range that would have an impact. Sure, um, it, it would definitely choir the vocal range in here for yeah for full bass isolation. It's it's more than anything that you're considering. I feel pretty confident saying that. But for if if what you're like hearing is voices making its way from the theater upstairs or vice versa, um, you you could address that, but. What I would say to do is is go beyond your idea, but you were already like kind of halfway there in dropping the entire ceiling anyway. So now it's just go even further than you were planning to. I, I certainly wouldn't drop the whole ceiling to only put insulation in there. That's not worth it. Agreed. And again, uh, you know, what are you hearing? The other options are turn it down. Don't play it so loud, right? <laughs> and that won't be as much of an issue. Um I don't know if you could do anything to the floor above the room to really adjust this. Right? Pad, yeah, that is the other way carpet, to come at it. Maybe I don't know if that would help enough to make it worthwhile. Yeah, uh, but your wife might like it better if she gets some carpet upstairs. Could be. Um, yeah. All right, I'll go ahead and read this one. Matt in the UK and Jay had similar questions, so I bundled them together. Uh, where Matt lives, he is charged a high electric, uh, electrical tariff on his bill, so it was worth his while to save e- energy wherever he can. Every little bit helps. So what exactly does the eco mode on his Denon AV receiver do? Does it impact the sound quality? His room is small, and he rarely ever has the master volume turned up higher than minus 25, so could using Denon's eco mode save Gave him some electricity without negatively impacting his audio experience. So I'll read the notes here directly from Denon Support. When eco mode is used, voltage for the amp stage decreases about one third and amplifier stage energy loss decreases about one sixth compared to eco mode being off. It is recommended when using external application to leave eco mode set to on. This will reduce power consumption to less than 70 watts. When using eco mode on at lower volume levels, under 45 absolute, power consumption is about half as compared to leaving eco mode off. This is useful if using the AVR at night and you do not want to disturb others. When using eco mode auto, the circuit will control the power supply voltage by a relay. If the volume level is more than 45 absolute, the circuit will cut off. 
If the volume is less than 45 absolute, the circuit will switch on automatically. If listening at the threshold level of 45, you will hear the relay clicking on and off frequently. <laughs> Voltage for the amp stage does not change here, so power consumption would be the same as normal. Yeah, so, um, I mean, given the, the, the level that you had, so like not minus 25 on the relative scale, uh, usually they give you, what, about se plus 17? So you're not quite at the 45 absolute, because in the absolute, um, you know, it goes from zero at the bottom uh, going upwards. So you wouldn't be quiet enough if you use the auto mode to really be gaining any of the power savings. <laughs> Um, so you're, you're still loud, even though you're not terribly loud, you're still loud enough that you would be limiting the dynamic range of your performance somewhat. Uh, and certainly if you turned it higher than minus 25, if you had the eco mode set to just on, just flat on, you would be somewhat limiting the dynamic range. You wouldn't be able to get the maximum peak power output. But, um... Like, first of all, there's not really any harm in having it set to auto, <laughs> because if you are listening quieter, it will save you some power. And if you are listening louder, it'll just be the same as having turned eco mode off. So there's not much downside to leaving it on auto unless you hover your volume right around the point where that relay keeps flicking and your AV receiver is in the room with you and you can hear the audible click of the physical uh, voltage rail relay going on. That would be annoying and I wouldn't want to use auto in that scenario. But otherwise, I would, I would certainly have no problem giving auto a try um so i mean basically if you do limit the power somewhat somewhat limit your dynamic range like how bad is that really right it just means that the transient peak sounds are not going to be quite as loud as the signal called for essentially that's really all that's happening so is that end of the world stuff like maybe you you apply a little bit of dynamic range compression anyway right if you if you ever turned uh odyssey dynamic volume to low or something like that i would say go ahead and turn eco mode on in your situation where you're really not ever turning the volume level up close to reference volume so this is one where I think you could absolutely give it a try. My, my, I would suspect you don't notice a gigantic difference having eco mode on in your scenario. That would be my suspicion. I, I'm with you on the you know, try eco mode auto, see if you notice it or not. If you yeah, notice yeah, any yeah. downside to it, just pay the tariff. Yeah, so uh, Gene did uh, do one on uh, Yamaha's eco mode. Uh, he made a video about that. Now, in that one, they don't have an auto mode. It's either on or off. And so in that one, it basically cut the maximum power output by about half. <laughs> it just straight up cut it in half. And so instead of getting about 100 watts per channel, you're getting 50. Uh, now... What is that? That's three decibels of output at the top end of the range. Again, are you super duper going to notice that if you're never li listening at reference volume to begin with? I would argue like not having another three decibels of headroom is not the most noticeable thing, <laughs> really, you know? So what I would say, if he's playing it at minus 25, is it yeah. really using more than one or two watts anyways? Exactly. Well, how much are you going to really save here? So uh, I don't know. You can get one of those uh, watt genies and see what you're really pulling on. Sure, day. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Who was reading this one? Was I reading this one? I think I was reading this one. Go ahead. <laughs> also to do with Den and Amaranth's eco mode, uh, Jay heard us mention how the newest Den and Amaranth's receivers um, have the ability to individually set speaker channels to use just the pre-out connection and completely disconnect the built-in amplifiers channel by channel. On the slightly older receiver models from Den and Amaranth's, it was all or nothing. You could activate the pre-amplifier mode, but that would disconnect all of the built-in amps and if you wanted to use a mix of built-in and external amps, you had to leave the power run to all of the built-in amps, even if several of them weren't being used. And then going back even further, there were Denim Rats receiver models that didn't have the ability to disconnect the built-in amplifiers at all. Both the built-in amps and the pre-out uh, outputs would always be getting power, and such was the case with his current receiver, which is a Marantz SR6011. So Jay found that when he tried to power all of his speakers with just the built-in amplifiers, his receiver got downright hot to the touch. He was using four ohm speakers, so he went ahead and he got an Outlaw Model 5000 to power his five floor level speakers, but that didn't seem to actually help much in terms of how hot to the touch the top of his receiver would still get. So he tried using the eco mode, and that made a very noticeable difference when it came to the amount of heat that was being generated. It didn't seem to have any detrimental effect to the sound quality or the receiver's other functions. 
So is there any downside to putting your receiver into eco mode when you're using it as a pre-amplifier and even if you're using it as a mix of built-in and external amps? So, I mean, we had it straight from Denon, right? They're like, yeah, we actually recommend putting it in eco mode when you're using it as a strict pre-amplifier because there isn't really much reason to be sending unused quiescent current to your built-in amplifiers when they aren't powering anything. Um, so putting it in eco mode there, Gene confirmed when you put the receivers in eco mode, it does not curtail any of the power going to the pre-outs. So if all you're using are the pre-outs, there's really no reason to not put it into eco mode and just not have as much voltage going to the built-in amplifiers. If you're doing a mix... If you're doing it the way you did it, where the main channels are being powered externally and the only thing you're powering are your overhead channels, I would argue that, yeah, putting it in eco mode is not likely to be super noticeable. Like, how often are you generating 105 dB peaks out of your four overhead speakers that are really going to demand the additional three, dec uh, three decibels of output power? So I would argue that putting it in eco mode makes a lot of sense unless you're driving your front speakers with the built-in amplifiers. I don't know, Joe, if you feel the same. Yeah, I think if, if you can get it to work for you, then that's a good thing. you got to remember that amplifiers are not 100% efficient, right? That no, they, no, they no, no. Even an amplifier on standby is going to be converting a lot of the electricity into heat, right? and that heat's got to go somewhere. I'm also curious, you know, what kind of ventilation he had on it, you know, how sure. much airspace there was around his receiver uh, when it was getting hot. But, yeah, uh, a four-ohm load is going to be more challenging to drive. If there's nothing, no load connected to the amplifier, that's mm -hmm. still that standby is going to generate some heat. But mm -hmm. yeah, so um, I, I think you found a solution that's working for you. Yeah. Bill. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bill heard Nick's question from a while back uh, where he was asking about Bluetooth earphones that could provide hearing protection while he is deadlifting. Now that he is using metal instead of rubber plates to get him up to the amount of weight he is lifting. Bill has been a lifter for over 25 years, and he fully understands how, even with a properly damped deadlifting platform, when you drop any amount of metal plates back down, the impact noise is very loud. But he also understands how Nick still wanted to be able to hear voices and therefore didn't want to just completely block his ears. So to that end, Bill came across the new Red Lithium Job Site earbuds from Milwaukee. They are fully wireless earbuds that are water, dust, and impact resistant for $180. They advertise their job site aware mode that allows voices through while still protecting your ears from loud noises, like a circular saw. The foam or silicon tips provide passive hearing protection, and you can adjust the active noise canceling via an app. What do you think of them as a potential solution? Uh, so, I mean, I would have to caveat that... Uh, I mean, as far as I know, uh, I'm not an audiologist, Joe. I don't think you're an audiologist. Not by um, trade. Yeah. And uh, I mean, to, to basically, I don't want to be on the hook in any sort of legal sense for saying, yep, these are going to be absolutely adequate protection. And then Nick or uh, who we're talking to, Bill, you know, wears these during deadlifting and they go and they still get hearing damage um, because there's there's no way I can put any sort of guarantee from my end that these are absolutely going to be sufficient hearing protection for that. Anything that is relying on active noise canceling, I wouldn't trust for a sudden burst transient sound, like a sudden drop or a gunshot drop, right? The active noise canceling is good for continuous sounds. A circular saw that's going and going and going, yeah, it's going to be able to use the microphones, active noise canceling, cancel out that sound. But an instantaneous loud bang, super loud clang from dropping down super heavy metal plate weights, I, I wouldn't trust active noise canceling to do that. I think actually the advice we got to go with the hearing protection that gun enthusiasts use is Agreed. probably the safest thing because that is designed for very sudden, single time loud bang shots that are going to be in that same sort of decibel range. And I'm trying to remember, was Nick trying to listen to music while he was lifting? It's more that he's got a spotter and he still wants to be able to hear the spotter. Right, okay. Right? So, Which makes sense. So two things. One, I agree. I've, I've worn the active noise canceling when I'm shooting, and it, it really is amazing that I'm able to carry on a conversation with someone mm. next to me, but the, the shotgun is brought way, way down. And then also, uh, some of the youth sports have just this season started allowing 
um, some of the active noise canceling, like the Apple uh, AirPods, okay. when you're shooting. And my son shoots with his in, and he said, yeah, it cuts it way. It sounds like a pop okay. gun when uh, he's shooting with those. Okay, so even, those, the, even the sudden non-droning sounds, it's working yeah. pretty well. Okay. Yeah. Now, neither of those are legally binding uh, audio advice, though. No, no, no. If you end up with hearing damage, we, we're going to still warn you that that could be the case. There's no way we're going to guarantee on our end that it's it's absolutely going to protect you from hearing damage. We we don't think we can go that far, not at all. But, but I do agree that you either need to cover the entire ear or you need to block mm. the ear canal with some of right. you know, the foam or the rubber type tips. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, I think we can at least do one more here. No um, problem. If yeah. you're okay with that. Yeah, so Dave, who is living on a U.S. military base in Japan, uh, or sorry, David, uh, David showed his wife the uh, SVS cylinder subs on their website, and she chuckled at them. And then he used their augmented reality tool, like I suggested he do, to get an idea of their size in their living room, seeing it on screen on their phone. And she laughed even harder. So the cylinder subs are a no-go. David, uh, does your wife know my wife? <laughs> After our discussion, David and his wife agreed with Tom and myself that the most sensible thing to do is just use the pair of SVS PB1000 subs that they already have on hand, and given their limited placement options, they'll just put them both up front on either side of the TV stand. So with that in mind, he just wanted to ask, should he use a Y splitter and essentially set them up as a single mono subwoofer, or should he subject himself to my Rob's 12-step guide of pain, he calls it, the 12-step guide guide to setting up dual subwoofers. Uh, he's using a Denon X3500H receiver, so what should he do when he comes to Odyssey's Multi-Q XD32 set up with, uh, what is that, what, what is the, the base EQ thing that they, the special thing that has the, uh, the two independent subwoofer outputs, at least as far as trim level and uh, volume goes. So uh, base EQ HT, I think that, that rang a bell. So could he just use the two subwoofer outputs and let the auto, auto setup give each sub its own distance and trim level setting? Or, or should he use the auto setup just to level match the two subs and then go back to using a Y splitter to treat the two subs as a single mono subwoofer? Um, so yeah, did you have an opinion on that one, Joe? I would say try it both ways. Uh, <laughs> if you've got the time and the patience, yeah. sure. it's going to cost you a Y splitter in you know fifteen twenty minutes, right? Mm -hmm. So realistically, uh, I I kind of take Tom's lazy approach that I probably just plug both inputs into the receiver, run it, and see how it sounds, and then like the chances are, I mean, look, we we can't guarantee this because when it comes to setting the the distance setting uh, automatically, uh, it isn't just the the tape measure distance. It is going to be basing on what the microphone phasing. perceives yeah. at the listing position, but. Chances are, if you've just got two subwoofers, identical subwoofers on either side of your TV stand, the chances that the automatic system is going to set wildly different delay settings for those two outputs is pretty low, in my experience, is pretty low that it's going to give you wildly different delays. So in essence, it's going to treat them like mono subs anyway. Like if the delays right. that are set to the so, two independents are really close, that's the same as having used a Y splitter. For symmetrically, all symmetrically located subs in a yeah. relatively symmetrical room are going to, you might as well stack them on top of each other in between because that's what they're going to exactly. sound like. So it really should calibrate pretty close to that. I, I would, I, I, as a starting point, I would go ahead and just use the two subwoofer outputs of your Denon X3500H. I would set it up as, yes, I do have two subwoofers. So exactly as the intuitive setting would go, I'd run through the Odyssey setup process and dollars to donuts, when you ba look back through what it's done, it's going to have set very close distance settings for those two subs. And if it has, I wouldn't worry about it any further than that. I'd go ahead and use that because that's the same as running a Y splitter for all intents and purposes. And, and I'm, I'm doing the same thing on my preamp, going to my right. two subs because they're equidistant, uh, mirrored in the room, mirrored to my listening position. So, yeah. All right, so Andy's question is multi-part and pretty long. I'm willing to go over our two-hour time if you are, but if you're not, I'm willing to stop too. But rounding off at 10 questions would be nice. So are you willing to go through? Let's let's push through on Andy. Let's do Andy's and that'll be that. Okay. Uh, Andy is wondering about some upgrades that he has in mind and he'd like to get our thoughts. His theater area is roughly 13 by 15, but it's open on one side to this kitchen. So, yeah, it's like 13 by 40. Uh, <laughs> he has a single row of three seats, and his only room treatments are a pair of gig panels on the back wall behind his seats. At the moment, he has a Denon X3300W, which tops out at seven channels, either a 7.2 or a 5.2. 2. 
Uh, he's got five Klipsch Reference 2 series speakers with one pair of Klipsch RP140SA Atmos modules, one SVS PB2000 sub, and a new PC2000 Pro that he just bought on sale. And his display is a 65-inch LG C7 OLED. Part 1, subwoofer placement. This is his first time using dual subwoofers. Uh, they should go diagonally opposite on one another across his theater area, right? No, across the room, right? The yes, entire the area. the entire your, room. And in fact, if... Your base wants to go in your kitchen. It sure does. Yeah, it has no idea that you have a designated theater area. It just sees the entire open volume of air as one room. So if you have the ability, there is every chance if the... Because he said it's open on a side to the kitchen. So if the square footage of the the cubic footage of air of the kitchen is is a relatively close to the uh, cubic footage of the living room area the uh, the theater area that's been designated having both subwoofers uh, like let's say the opening is on his left hand side just for the sake of argument if the opening is on your left hand side having both of your subwoofers on the left hand side of your theater area but one at the front and one at the back is pretty close to having them like at the midpoints of the front and the back wall the total front and back wall Wall, having them at the midpoints there so diagonally across the theater area in this instance i would say probably not but it's going to be more likely that they're both on one side i agree with you but that assumes that his kitchen that he can close doors and seal it off to the, from the rest that's, of the house that's right because right. otherwise that base is just going to keep on going if it's all open to the whole rest of the house uh so i don't know the exact situation that's going on there now we're basically into this is just unpredictable. <laughs> we just don't really know what placement is going to work best. I would still argue that I want the subwoofers across from each other, like not co-located or both at the front or both at the back or that type of thing. I would still want to have separation between the two subs, but trying to predict if if the kitchen is not just open to the theater area, the kitchen is also open to the rest of the house. We're into just unpredictable territory. We don't really know what the best placement option is going to be at that point. So there you're sort of down to some trial and error uh, and, and some measurement to confirm if you want to do that, or at the very least, playing some sweeps and listening to them <laughs> in all the seats that you care about and seeing how uniform you can get. But if this is the kitchen and theater area or sort of a contained room, that those together are sort of a contained room, then having both of the subwoofers on one side of your theater, one at the front, one at the back, is most likely, mathematically speaking, to give you the uniformity results. Yeah, if you can mirror them, that's going to be the best approach. Yeah. Uh, for the subwoofers at the back of the room, he also bought subwoofer. Sorry, he also bought the SVS SoundPath wireless adapter so that he wouldn't have to run a long cable. Mm -hmm. How does that impact his dual subwoofer setup? Shouldn't I mean that shouldn't be an so issue I mean, if you're doing the wireless. Yeah, the the wireless adapter will have added some latency, so it's almost like there's been a delay applied to the subwoofer at the back. Uh, and assuming that what he's using is a wire just to connect the subwoofer at the front of the room directly to uh, one of the sub outputs, then the sub at the back now has an additional delay applied to it by the wireless uh, connector that the sub at the front didn't. Now, one solution would be you just get two wireless receiving units. And so both subwoofers are connected wirelessly. That Now they have equal latency. Uh, do you remember if that 3300 has the auto setup mic? Uh, well, it definitely has an Odyssey microphone that comes with it. I don't so, remember if it was new enough to have multi QXT32 with the sub EQHT um, dual subwoofer setup. I don't recall yeah. if it was new enough for that. So if we're just talking about a single subwoofer output, uh, why splitting it? One of them is going to the sub at the front directly with a wire. The other one is going into the wireless transmitter. I mean, look, you have SVS subs. They have fully variable phase. So sure. you can do my 12-step guide. It's still going to work. <laughs> and you can adjust the, vari uh, the variable phase on one of them until you get the most uniform results that you're able to achieve. Now, now I also, I wouldn't rule out running a wire. I mean, you can get RG6 oh, yeah. and, and run that around the outside of the room and tuck it under the floorboard where the carpet comes in. And it, it's could. not a big deal. But this uh, isn't something that is like insurmountable. You have right. fully variable phase on the SVS sub, so you can absolutely still tune them. Just, yeah, it's going to be essentially like you added some distance to the setting of the rear sub with the latency added by the wireless adapter. Correct. 
Next part of the question, would it be worth upgrading his Denon X3300W receiver? He's noticed the new X3800H and X4800H are available from accessories for less. Any reason to go with one over the other? His main reason for the upgrade would be to expand from 5.2.2 to a 5.2.4 setup. Hmm. And, and I'll throw out there, I just picked up a 3800 off of accessories for less. I think it was like 11.99 for a... Yep. A B stock and a smoking deal on that thing. It but is between the thirty eight hundred and the forty eight hundred. There's a little bit of a power difference, but not a ton uh, feature wise between the two of those. And with Klipsch reference two speakers and thirteen by fifteen space, those I can't are super imagine, efficient. <laughs> I can't imagine that what you're absolutely crying out for is one and a half decibels more output at the very top of things. Yeah, so and those are what ninety two, ninety three dB efficient. I'm guessing. But, that's yeah, right. But. Yeah. So I, I would go ahead. I mean. Usually I'd go ahead with the X3800H anyway because with the price difference, you could maybe get a two-channel amp for something that needs more power. It's rare that all of the speakers need more power. Um, but the only thing I'm quibbling with is to upgrade his X3300W only to go from 5.2 to 5.2 to 5.2.4. Like if he doesn't need the HDMI capabilities, if he doesn't need multi-Q XD32, like if the only thing you're doing it for is to get two more Atmos channels, it's a little tough for me to say that you really need to do that upgrade. But at the same time, he's, well, so look, his OLED is a C7, so that's not doing 4K 120, right? So it's like, uh, you know, well, value-wise. But, but we talked about the subwoofers, that the 3800 is yep. going to have the better um, Odyssey in that, so. Yeah, yeah, it's, like, I'm not saying that you're, like, really missing out by keeping your 3300W for the time being. I'm not going to say this is going to be some kind of majorly transformative upgrade going to a 3800H. But, but he does talk about later on he wants to go in-ceiling potentially with all right. four speakers, so we'll get to yeah. that. Uh, uh, if he does if, get look, if the money's if the money's no problem, then I would say get the thirty eight hundred H. There's not really yeah. an incentive for you to get a forty eight hundred H. Yeah, agreed. Uh, if he gets a new receiver, what should he get to get? What should he do to get rid of his X thirty three hundred W? With his theater area size and seating distance, along with his Klipsch speakers, he doesn't need additional amplification, does he? Nope. No. No. <laughs> no. Um, what do you do to get rid of it? Well, it's a boat anchor. No. Um, I, so I, I have bought and sold a ton of gear. Uh, okay. I used to do a lot of it on eBay. Uh, a lot of what I built in my own theater, I bought entire systems from folks and kept the pieces I want and sold off the rest. Okay. Um, Today, the biggest problem with eBay is how many fees they take. So I've sure. sold uh, a lot of gear through the forums, okay. uh, whether it's ABS forum, Apply Escape forum, places like that, because they don't really charge you anything. How about uh, Audiogon? Uh, used it some. It, Audiogon's kind of more of an upper end product line, right? So those are the okay. little more esoteric speakers. Um, there is a US Audio Mart, uh, mm -hmm. which is another place where you can get rid of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, Craigslist. Uh, again, you're dealing with Craigslist folks, but uh, that's another place you can sell locally. Uh, Facebook Marketplace. There are some good groups on Facebook Marketplace. So mm -hmm. uh, Youth Man Classifieds, Home Theater Classifieds, which are groups that you can ask to be part of. Uh, and you see people selling a, a lot of gear on those. But for a 3300W, you're going to get like 200 bucks for that thing. It's just, it's yeah. <laughs> it's a five or six year old receiver with you know HDMI capabilities that are dated at this point compared to something like a 3800 yeah. I, I would almost say keep it for a, another system in another room or as a mm. backup or as a spare or give it to a buddy right you know let let somebody else suppose, start yeah. building the system around that thing uh you can move to the garage for a two channel and there's you know, other things you can do with it so yeah yeah, so I looked it up. Uh, yeah, the 3300W does have XT32, so, <laughs> you know, yeah, um, it, it could still serve you quite well, honestly, if you're like, do I, the, the four overhead speakers, if that's not make or break, if that was the only reason to upgrade, I might sort of lean towards keeping it for a little bit until you have something else in your system that basically demands a receiver upgrade. Yeah, and you can easily look on eBay to see what used ones have sold for in the past and kind sure. of take a, a general number from that. Uh, with his current single pair of Atmos modules, he just put them on top of his front towers and used them as upfiring Atmos speakers. Uh, he has been less than thrilled. It doesn't particularly sound as though things are coming from overhead. So he was hoping if he hires someone to run some in-ceiling wires and has four speakers mounted overhead, maybe that will impress him more. 
what do we think? And living in San Francisco in a condo, what sort of ballpark figure do we think it will cost to run those wires and mount four speakers to the ceiling? So I got a couple of thoughts on this, but Rob, you go first. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I fully agree. Uh, Tom's written a great article over at AV Gadgets about how picky, like, pickier than you would possibly imagine the upward firing Atmos modules actually are. And just the regular advice, Dolby says this themselves, right? Just plop them on top of your front towers. Um, that is definitely not going to always be the optimal position for the uh, upward firing speakers. They are very, very picky about optimal placement to give you the illusion that sounds are coming from above instead of just another speaker, pair of speakers that are in front of you. Um, so yeah, that's a challenge there. It will be better to have four speakers physically above you. Um, but the exact amount is pretty subjective, right? Some people hear that and they're like, I love it. I'm super glad I did it. I think it was worth every penny. Other people hear it and they're like, I hear a difference, but I don't necessarily think it was worth what I paid. Or there's some people who are like, I barely noticed a difference and no, nobody is wrong. Nobody is wrong. That That is very much a subjective call. So I would almost be eager to like with exactly what you already have. Can you temporarily just raise your speakers? <laughs> um, you know, put them up on a pair of ladders or something in like the top middle positions, uh, just to give yourself any sort of inkling whether you're the type of person who's going to notice and love it. I, I would sort of try to do anything temporary first with what you already have on hand. Um, as far as pricing goes, I have no clue. Uh, I don't know if Joe could help out on that. Yeah, well, San Francisco, you know, you're probably looking for five hundred bucks. But um, a couple of things: one, you know, you could install a pair of front speakers now, but run, you know, a fourteen four wire to each of those, right. and putting in yeah. the back ones later on would be easy to do, right? right. That's well, depending on which way your joists are going. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's getting the wires up there for someone who's experienced and has the right tools. Not so hard. Okay. Um, but yeah, I would definitely, you need to hear this. So either yeah. you, you need to get into a retailer or let's see, you live in San Francisco. If you're not a mm -hmm. serial killer, give me a call. You can come over and listen to it at my house. <laughs> but uh, it, it, you really need to experience what the four speakers overhead sound like in order right. to uh, make that kind of a decision before you you know start cutting holes and everything. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's my kind of take on it. But again- also any person who's going to do this work, they should be capable of giving you a quote before you commit to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think there's too much risk in just, uh, you know, asking uh, a contractor what their ballpark figure I, is going to be. I think you can go on, you know, uh, bestbuy.com and I think Geek Squad right. might have prices posted for this for one that. they might would do it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, he was thinking he'd get a pair of less expensive Klipsch R40SA Atmos modules to go along with his pair of RP140SA. Any reason for concern with a slight mismatch? For Atmos no. speakers, no. Yeah. I'm not concerned. I'm not concerned about but, it at all. Well, I where are you going to put the back ones? Are you going to stack them on top of your back speakers? You're going to get the same kind of results you're getting off your front speaker stack. Um, yeah, I, I would. I strongly prefer in ceiling uh, for immersive okay. audio. Uh, so I really. I would I would save your money. Don't don't buy more modules that you'll be disappointed with. Also, okay, yeah, I'm not I'm not against that. Yep. Uh, he was thinking of upgrading his 65 inch C7 OLED to a new 77 inch C3. With that, what will that be an appreciable upgrade in picture quality? Uh, it's going to be about a um, 12 inch better quality. How's that? <laughs> I mean the thing. It like, assuming the C7 OLED was the first OLED you ever got, it's certainly not going to be the picture quality upgrade that you got from going from an LCD LCD TV to your first OLED. Um, there's pretty minimal picture quality difference. Like, that C7 OLED is still a very, very good-looking TV. Is the C3 ever so slightly brighter? Yes. Uh, it can do 4K 120 where your C7 can't. So if you're a high-end gamer, you might notice that. But if you're just like, I'm going to notice the same kind of picture quality upgrade going from one OLED to another, no, that's going to be pretty minimal. Um, you might notice it being a little bit brighter, but even that, it's not some kind of earth-shattering difference there. So you'll notice the size improvement. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't go be expecting, yeah, whatever difference you went when you got your first OLED. It's not going to be that kind of difference from a C7 to a C3. They're much closer in overall picture image quality than they are different. Now, you are going to get a better field of view, though. I mean, that yes. is a, a 
substantially bigger yes, uh, display. So depending on how close you're sitting to it, you might be getting a better experience from that. Uh, any reason to switch out his Oppo 203 Ultra HD <laughs> Blu-ray player? God, no. <laughs> Hang on to it. Sorry. Uh, for the record, he discovered its HDR target luminance setting and adjusting that down to 800 nits seemed to make quite a difference. Um, I, I Again, we talked about this earlier. I yep. got an Oppo 203. People get rid of them. I, you could go out and buy a Panasonic 820, but those are... Good. 350 bucks on sale, you know, ballpark. 400 most often. Yep. Yeah. So let's say you sell your Oppo for 800 bucks or 400 bucks mm-hmm. in the positive, but the Oppo is a much better built player. It's a <laughs> very reliable player. It's, it's, I mean, there isn't a reason to get rid of it. 400 they, bucks is a reason. But. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, yeah. There's not a performance reason. There could Agreed. be a financial reason to do it. Um, well, yeah, but, so. but I would say also, Panasonic is is a company that is still supporting. Oppo That's still supports theirs, but they're still manufacturing and yeah. still actively have people that can you know answer questions and things like that. Um, you know, the Oppo two hundred three was the the end of a beautiful dream mm. that, that that legacy but yes, stopped. If you if you just keep your Oppo two hundred three because you love it, uh, I'm certainly not going to say that's a bad decision because uh, we're, we're both Joe and I are in the same boat with that. I was under the impression though that that HDR target luminance setting was specifically to do with converting HDR to SDR. Um, I, I, I don't believe, cause I mean, the, the Oppo 203 doesn't do what the Panasonic players do. It doesn't do HDR optimizer. It doesn't retone map inside of the Oppo. So I was under the impression that the HDR target luminance setting was all about its HDR to SDR conversion, uh, where you can alter what the target luminance is to, uh, basically recover or, uh, dim down specular highlights. So I would just have a second look at that. <laughs> well, he, he says, for the record, he discovered its HDR target luminance setting and adjusted yeah. it down to 800. It seemed to make it quite... He's not saying it was playing it back in yeah, SCR, HDR, but yeah. I, That's we, true. And, and yeah. I was I was watching this. I was using the same thing with... Uh, you know, I used to have a Panasonic 800 projector mm-hmm. that was SDR, moved to the JVC NX5, and its ver- early version of its software had no, right. no tone mapping. Yeah. So the Oppo played a big role in that because yes. I could set it to, you know, it was, it was 175 nits is where I figured out right, right about the right spot for it. Uh, and it did a really good job of bringing the 4K into a much more watchable state yeah. until they added more capability to the projector. Yeah, with with an LG OLED, even going back to the C7, it had pretty good uh, tone mapping in there. So I'm, I, I certainly don't uh, contend that it didn't make any sort of visible difference, but I wouldn't necessarily be going for HDR to SDR conversion with an OLED. It's not really necessary um, if, if what you're going after is just accuracy to the signal because uh, the LG OLEDs do a pretty good job of tone mapping. They're, they're not bad at all. All right, so let's stop there because, my goodness, we've got almost two and a half hours here, which wasn't the intent, but uh, I will say that we have Scott and Jorge together as uh, two similar questions that I paired on the list, Jonathan and Bertrand. Uh, oh, and Daz as well. Okay, there we go. So all of you are on the list. We will get to you first up next week. Uh, so, yeah, first of all and foremost, Joe, thank you so much for oh, pinch hitting and filling in. I appreciate you reaching out. I, you know, To be able to do this twice in two nights is awesome. <laughs> I'm glad you feel that way because some people will be like, oh my goodness, leave me alone. Let me get some rest, especially after returning from Cedia. Come on, that- any chance to talk home theater is a good time absolutely so that is fantastic thank you very very much uh hoping all the best for tom hope he's able to come back and join us as usual next week uh but i want to go back up and thank our listeners of the week people who supported this podcast andy thank you for your paypal donation uh patreon.com slash av rant podcast is where you can go to make uh sign up to make an automatic monthly donation so a big thanks to our 133 patrons over there and then thank you to elmer parker matt jay kev Kevin, Carl, Andy, Scott, Gurinder, and Daz for your notes of gratitude and encouragement. They are very, very appreciated right now. So thank you all very much. Thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. The place to send your questions is question at avrant.com, our email address, best way to reach us. And first in, first out, all questions answered, reach out to us, question at avrant.com. So with that, on behalf of Tom Andre and for AV Rant, I am Rob H. And I'm Joe. Joe Kuznick, now go out and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com.
This is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.